Big Dumb Movie is a comedic podcast that often contains obscene language and outlandish commentary. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to Big Dumb Movie, where we discuss movies of the big dumb variety. I'm your host, Corey, and I'm joined today by Steve. I told you I want to be Dr. Steve. The island of Dr. Steve. That's right. <laughs> Hello. And also joining us for the first time in a long time is my good pal, Review Dude Josh. I'm not dead, dickheads. Oh my god, he's back. I'm back. <gasps> we had to dig him out of the back of a very, very large closet. Yes. Nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> my name is Azazello. <laughs> oh man, you guys... <laughs> it's good to have you with us, Josh. Thank you also, Steve, for joining this episode, which is on The Island of Dr. Moreau, the 1996 version. This is a very special movie, I think. Wait, it is? I watched The Island with Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, you can't help yourself with these Michael Bay films, I, can you? No, that's The Other Island with uh, uh, Black Widow in it. Oh, you're thinking of Shutter Island? Yeah, oh, I, oh, that's, that's <laughs> Shutter Island, but then there's also The Island that he was in in the early 2000s with, uh, now I'm blanking on the actress's name, uh, the one where he goes to Thailand and finds an island where all the young people are sort of living. Have you not seen that movie? Bloodsport? It, no, all right. You know what? We're gonna have to have a discussion about this. Kickboxer. Off the- it's a Danny Boyle movie. So I watched Gulligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Eureka's Castle. <laughs> oh God! What was the dragon's name on Eureka's Castle? Magellan. Magellan. <laughs> there you go. All right. Now that we got that, I watched X jokes out of the way. <laughs> oh, we're not done. <laughs> <laughs> I actually watched X. Oh, all right. God. We're gonna talk about Island of Doctor Moreau. And it kind of leads me to some opening discussion topics about these leading men we get in this movie. There's a couple big name actors in this movie. There's a big name director. There's a big story to this movie, obviously, which we'll get to. But Marlon Brando is a guy that doesn't come up a lot on this podcast, Steve. No. No, and it's funny because the last 15 to 20 years of his career are actually pockmarked with a lot of this kind of work. Like, yeah. Do you have anything noteworthy about Brando to say? Like, any performances or stories? Like, what do you think about Brando? Well, as far as performances, I mean, the dude was, if nothing else, was prolific. He's regarded by some as being one of the greatest actors who ever lived. How much any given person agrees with that is, of course, subject to debate. I mean, Streetcar Named Desire, The Godfather, Last Tango in Paris, Mutiny on the Bounty... I, this is a guy that that had a career that spanned decades and included a, a huge number of performance accolades, both on stage and on screen. He, me, many of the movies he was in were at least nominated for or ended up winning Academy Awards. He 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 was a legend in his own time and continued to get work way way past his actual prime, mostly on the back of his reputation. And and this film is a perfect example of that because he became more and more difficult to wrangle and deal with as the years went on. And as he got older, he knew that his reputation was often enough to get him parts and that once he was on, he was unlikely to be fired and he took advantage of it and, and built a reputation, especially during the last 25 years of his life of just being a massive, massive pain in the ass to the point where people sometimes didn't want to work with him. And there were other cases where people so desperately wanted to work with him, they were willing to totally ignore the difficulty level just to be involved in something he was in. And that fed into this. That, that I'll, I'll have another note on that when we get to the, the casting part, but that definitely became an element with this film. I just want to say that Marlon Brando was in the Michael Jackson music video for You Rock My World. In the, only in the extended one, though. There's right. like three cuts of that music video. Yes. One of them he's cut out completely, which is fucking weird. Jackson did a few of those, right? There, there was uh, one for Remember the Time, and one for there was the big one for Thriller, obviously. And there was, the Dangerous album had another video for another song that had uh, Macaulay Culkin in it. Um, yeah, that was black or white. That was actually white. on bad. That was on bad. You're right. Yeah, you know, and um, yeah, he had a few of those where like there was a three minute cut that was for normal like MTV play, but there would be like a six minute video version that had extra stuff in it. 
Yeah, MC Hammer. MC Hammer had one. I think it was for Too Legit to Quit or one of his other big title tracks. The video for that song it feels like it's about 20 minutes long. And the first, the first like eight minutes of it is just background and lead up and him doing a skit backstage before he gets to the song. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I was a big Michael Jackson fan. It sounds yeah. like you were somewhat as well. But the uh, You Rock My World, that's one of my, it's probably my single favorite Michael Jackson song, actually. But that video is just like weird. I feel like Jackson continually tried to recapture the magic of Thriller. Yeah. And some of his videos were great. But some of them, like You Rock My World, were just, it was just like a try hard, like Scorsese mini film. Like, like he just wanted to make this like little mob movie. Right. I, I've had a few people freak out at me for expressing this, and I really don't mean any insult to Jackson because I do think that in his own right, he was a, a genius by himself without anyone's help. But yes, the absolute best. Wrote of, a lot of his hits. Right. But the, the absolute, absolute best of his music was really co produced in at least partly co-written with Quincy Jones. It was, I think, two separate albums. And the stuff that he went on to later was still iconic and hugely popular and great in its own right, but he was never able to really quite recapture the peak of when he was working with, with Quincy. And Quincy is another just absolute brilliant mind. I think sometimes, regardless of how brilliant a person might be on their own, I think sometimes you need that. You need the extra seasoning that other genius adds to it or you need some extra perspective they land or one of them keeps the other in check apple's best products from the late 80s and early 90s were, were from the era when wozniak and steve jobs were just running the company together before steve left and it became more corporate like there's something about the dynamic between two people in that way i think brings out the best in both of them or sometimes the worst but even Quincy does give a lot of credit to Michael Jackson. Of course. I had like one of his albums, I think it was Thriller or Bad, where it had like the song and then Quincy's commentary of the song as this independent track afterwards. Yeah. It was pretty interesting, but pretty much universally he was giving all the credit to Michael Jackson. But I think he was just being a little humble, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he was as well. And again, I'm not trying to say that Jackson was incapable of doing anything without Quincy Jones being there, but there's... And I think, again, the later stuff is the evidence of it because he kept trying to repeat what he'd been doing there and could never do it quite as well. It was it may have been 95 percent as good, but it was never, never quite at that same level. You know, and I mean, look, it happens. There are certain actors whose best work happens repeatedly with the same director, you know? Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Collaborative efforts like a good old Corey and Steve podcast. <laughs> but not, not only are we here, Review to Josh is here. And I have a question for you, Josh. We talked about Marlon Brando, but what about the other guy, Val Kilmer? Do you oh. like him? Do you like his performances, stories about him? What do you think? Oh, Val Kilmer, often referred to as the chameleon of acting by me just now. <laughs> <laughs> you do often say that just now. Uh, I do. Too much, actually. <laughs> I was going through his IMDb. And he has just so many iconic performances to choose from. From He's been some great ones. Batman Forever, to Ugh. The Saint, to his many countless straight-to-DVD performances. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, I think, just personally, my favorite performance by him, not necessarily his best, but just my favorite, is actually Gay Perry in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Okay, first things first, we gotta move her somewhere. You got gloves? Excuse me? Gloves, do you have gloves? You have to move her. If it's a frame up, some asshole's probably calling the cops on you right now. Do this, wrap up the body in a blanket, a sheet, anything. Okay, okay, uh, any particular kind of gloves? Yes, fawn. Will you fucking hurry? Perry. Yeah? I peed on it. What, what, you peed on what? I peed on the corpse, can they do like ID from that? I'm sorry, you, you peed on, on the corpse, and my question, is no, my question, I get to go first. Why in perfect hell would you pee on a corpse? I didn't intend to. It's not like I did it for kicks. God. It's a good movie. It is a good movie. It, it, I think it's probably one of the last worthwhile ones he did before he got too ill to keep working. And I don't mean that part as an insult. I actually feel quite bad about how, how physically ill he is. But Same. Yeah. Yeah. It is sad. I don't wish that on my worst enemy. No. You know? So, like, that's that's a hard thing to have to deal with, but... It has resulted in some hilarious performances. <laughs> <laughs> he was in a 2017 movie called The Snowman, starring Michael Fassbender. It's like a murder mystery thriller based on oh some... Oh my 
God. Based on some Scandinavian books. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the books were super popular. That movie got hyped to shit, and I love that type of film. So I saw the ads, and I was like, oh, my God, this movie's going to be amazing. Me too, and, dude. Right? And then it came out, and it was like, within two days, I'm not just nothing. But bam, 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 bam from everyone. Every, every angle, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> it was um, like the worst movie I saw of 2017. Right? I knew very little about that movie, but I I heard about the hype train for it, and the trailers looked pretty decent. And then, yeah, like you said, the moment it came out, just bad review, bad review, bad review. Worst movie ever. (laughs) I saw that movie in theaters, and I also hosted a podcast on The Snowman at Spoilers. So if anyone wants to hear me talk about it more, you can listen to it over there. It was a fun episode, but... The snowman? Val Kilmer plays a guy called Rafto, and he can't speak anymore, and he couldn't speak at the time of filming this movie. Right. So they ADR'd him with... Like, they picked the person that couldn't sound further away from Val Kilmer. It's so awkward. Can you tell me... Well, was your wife seeing anyone? And the weirdest thing is... Anyone who doesn't believe me should watch the documentary he made for Amazon because his son does a lot of the narrating for him. His son Jack sounds surprisingly a lot like him, and they definitely could have made it even better with a little bit of computer help. And when they – I won't go into all the detail, but there's a scene in Blade Runner they had to correct – the ADR didn't match the lip movement, and it had never been corrected, and when they were doing the final cut, they needed to get it corrected, and – Harrison Ford's eldest son was almost exactly the same age that Harrison had been when they filmed the movie, and their voices sound so much alike that when they did the ADR correction, they had Ford's son come in and read the dialogue, and they were able to match it using computer software. It sounds unintelligibly different. I mean, not at all different. Not at all different. Why didn't they just get Alden Ehrenreich? (laughs) He he had plenty of free time. I have a really good feeling about this. Right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, it would have worked really well. It's a very strange choice. So Val Kilmer, I also want to talk about just before he got sick, he was doing this one man show on Mark Twain. Like yeah. he had been developing this script for a Mark Twain epic for years and to kind of like get it off the ground, he turned it into a one man show and he basically like transformed himself into Mark Twain. And by that, I mean, I don't mean method acting. I just mean that he was doing a really good job of acting on the stage. Yeah. And he had a really good makeup job and costume. And it seemed really cool from the footage I saw of it. Like, it seemed like a really, like, kind of like awesome, like artsy approach. Like, you know, who who picks Mark Twain to like make an epic out of? And, you know, he is a, a very historic and great American author. So it's like, I don't know. I just think there was something cool about that. Like, yeah, I, I like respected yeah. that. I never saw it, but I saw clips of it and it was... It seemed really cool. We had a terrible teacher, Mrs. Strickling. She stood in front of our class. She used to stand up there with the switch behind her back. One day she was staring right at me. She said, now then, class, are there any idiots in the room? (laughs) And if there are, to please stand up. Well, after quite a long silence, I stood up. Oh, my then, young Sammy Clemens, why do you feel you are an idiot? I said, actually, ma'am, I don't. I just hate to see you standing up there all by yourself. (laughs) I nailed her. Whoa, she came at me with that switch. She was going to tear my heart off. I've never sat through the whole performance myself. Obviously, he's not performing it anymore, but my understanding is a very much... Very much like an evening with Mark Twain, which I think is kind of a nice way to pitch it. Kilmer's a good actor, but he's not a, I don't mean this as an insult. He's not a super, super heavy material kind of actor, I don't think. You know, I, 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 and he, I think he found the right tone with Twain in terms of like this light evening with Twain that worked, worked for him. I really enjoy his performance in The Doors. Yeah, that was, I think, the closest to like a method thing he's ever done and I mean that as a compliment he went nuts with background research and lived as as uh as Morrison for a while basically and was was just spending spending all day watching videos while emulating Morrison's movements and he look the he apparently got Stone interested in casting him by filming an audition video totally unsolicited and just mailing it to Oliver Stone's people 
But it turns out, if you look at pictures, Morrison, the last two, three years of his death, could have been Val Kilmer's fucking brother. They almost look so much alike. It is. It's yeah. uncanny, yeah. He's very transformative in that role. Yeah, perfect casting. It reminds me of a completely unrelated film called Last Days. Oh, yeah. Starring Michael Pitt. And it was directed by Gus Van Sant. Michael Pitt in this movie looks exactly like Kurt Cobain. That's right. Pitt, Pitt's an interesting young actor. He, well, youngish. He worked, I guess he's not that young anymore. <laughs> yeah, he, and he, he started working when he was in his late teens, early 20s. He had a part in the movie Bully, which is really a terrible movie. But, um, yeah, he's, and, but he, he keeps getting these good parts in relatively small films. He's never been really super mainstream. I think the only thing he's been in that a really large number of people would recognize him from is his part in uh, Boardwalk Empire, which he was good in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, di and didn't he, like, get himself fired from that? You know, that might be the case. His character did... I don't want to run for anyone who watched it, but I'll put it this way. <laughs> the character does end up leaving the show at one point, but I don't... Yeah. I, I didn't know if... I'm not aware if that's because that was the natural end they wanted or if because they, they canned him. He was much. notoriously difficult on okay. that show. Like, yeah. the stories came out from that show. Kind of like how stories of Kilmer came out from movies around this era of right. him being difficult. Yeah. Which we'll talk about more shortly. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm going to both defend and burn him a little bit anyway. Either way, yeah. <laughs> Before we go into this movie... I just want to quickly make a correction to something I said on the last Samurai podcast. Do you remember we were talking about Scientology, Steve? I do. <laughs> remember we were talking about Thetans? Yes. You said that Thetans, those are the things that attach to your body. Yeah, but I'm, I'm full concession. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But And I said, no, that's actually not correct. Right. I did a little bit more research. And I, I'm, it's still right. The Thetan is your soul. But apparently, there is an OT level where it's explained that other Thetans that are not inhabiting bodies do attach themselves to living yeah. bodies. And you have to do a certain level of auditing to get them off of you physically. I, I'm not trying to be shitty about it. I just, I could have sworn that I'd learned that at some point and that I'd learned it from somebody, like from a documentary or from a former Scientologist like yourself. Like, I, I knew that I didn't have it exactly right, but I knew that I'd heard that from someone who, who knew what they were talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're actually right. This sounds like a fascinating religion. How much money do I give them? <laughs> how much you got? <laughs> it depends on how far up the pyramid you want to get. This is definitely oh, not a pyramid scheme, by the way. Tom Cruise be willing. I want to get to the tippy top. It's like the Amway of religions. Sorry, anybody. <laughs> well, the Island of Dr. Moreau, the 1996 version, loosely based on the old H.G. Wells book from like what is it, 1896 or something? Yeah, a book came out in 1896. Steve, how the hell was this movie made? Fuck me. <laughs> Look, all right, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot because I always talk a lot, but I'm going to tell you right now, there. Are, I, I'm not going to try to touch every little thing because there's way too much. There are also way too many different accounts. How much cocaine was used? Can you answer I'm that? All right, well, I will tell you, and I'll go into this in more detail in a moment. There actually was a substantial amount of drug use happening. The funny I, thing I is, believe it. The funny thing is, the writers slash directors were not the ones really doing most of the drugs. It was cast people. But there's so much happening. So many different accounts. Anyone who's really that interested should go digging. There's a documentary called Lost Souls that's about Richard Stanley, the guy who was supposed to direct this film. It's interesting. Val Kilmer spends a moment talking about it in the mo in the documentary he did for Amazon. I will want to say that I do want to say that I've heard it said before: if police interview ten people who were all within fifty feet of the same event, they'll get ten different accounts of exactly what happened because none of them saw it exactly the same way. Sure. Yeah, and I guess so. That phenomenon happens a lot with movie sets, especially in instances where people are talking about stuff. 20, 30 years after the fact, and it wasn't something they were even in the room to see firsthand in the first place. It's a story they heard from someone else that was heard from someone else that was heard from someone else. I, I know this kind of stuff goes on. I've worked on sets. My family's worked on sets. Like, some of this stuff is not necessarily totally reliable. Anyway, all that all being said, it's just a guy named Richard Stanley. Stanley directed two short films in the early 80s, both of which did okay. 
during the late 80s, he, along with the help of a uh, producer, managed to sell a script, an idea he had uh, for a movie called Hardware, um, which actually starred an actor named Dylan McDermott very early in his career. It was a science fiction horror film, kind of a, a grindhouse type film about a dismantled cyborg that manages to rebuild itself and then goes on a violent rampage. The movie was produced for a million pounds, uh, which at the time was actually kind of a lot of money for an indie film. It came out in 1990 and ended up making $70 million worldwide. It was such a huge success as an indie film, and, and Stanley considered it success, or uh, sorry, indication that a, a film, a major film written by him could be successful, that, that it allowed him and his producer, Joanne Seller, who'd gotten the money for hardware, to go on and uh, get another 2.8 million pounds for another idea of Stanley's called called Dust Devil. Dust Devil filmed in Africa. It involved a lot of different people and money interests. They got the movie shot and then post-production turned to hell. There was a lot of fighting about content and about editing. The producers were trying to take control away from him. There were multiple edits. At one point, Stanley went back to the United Kingdom without having finished the movie, and he claims was not fully paid for having worked on it. He also claims he had to put together millions of dollars over a period of years to get the movie finished. I don't know if that's true or not. This dude is a weird cat. He's the kind of guy who actually believes that like witch doctors and sorcerers are doing real magic. He actually believes this, and I'm going to get... He's a strange dude. I just want to inject here. He's... Watching him in the documentary that you mentioned, Lost Soul, The Doom Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau, it's a very wordy title. Right. He seems like a Tim Burton type. He is a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't think he's got the breadth and scope of vision that Burton does. Maybe he could have with the right money, though, like given like this, the because hardware looked really cool and artsy and like interesting and weird. And he's a weird dude. To me, he seems like an artist kind of dude, like. You know, more yeah. less of a Hollywood guy and more of an art kind of guy. So I think that you're at least partly right about that, and I'll touch on why momentarily. So this would have been his third feature. Island of Dr. Moreau and H.G. Wells from the late 1800s was one of his favorite books. He would started reading it as a kid because his father owned the first edition. He had this lifelong dream to turn it into a movie. Um, it had been adapted into a movie once before with Burt Lancaster, but Stanley didn't like the film. He... Starts looking around. He's in London. He, he he needs something to do. He starts, to your point, he starts putting together drawings, images, things he wants this film to look like. He decides immediately that if H.G. Wells were alive today, that the movie would be set contemporary and not in the 1890s because Wells envisioned it being a story about stuff happening in the very near future. So he moves the timeline up. He also adds an element of sort of Jesus Christ to it and starts trying to imagine Miro as being a misunderstood savior. And he's doing all this more than writing. He's doing all of it in art. He's doing it in sketches and snapshots. And he's drawing this tremendous amount of material to try to express the vision he has for this movie. And he takes what little is left of his money and he goes to a phone booth and he starts making just mad phone calls to people. And he ends up on the phone with... Edward Pressman, who had produced some other really amazing films, some Academy Award-winning stuff. He'd also produced Conan the Barbarian, or Schwarzenegger in it. And Pressman says, I love what you're telling me about this idea. So Stanley, Richard Stanley, and Edward Pressman start having conversations about this version of The Island of Dr. Moreau, and Pressman takes the idea to a guy at New Line Cinema called Mike DeLuca. DeLuca had gotten in at New Line early on. They were a relatively young studio. They'd been building a very quick name for themselves, producing a lot of uh, really big films. They were bringing in a lot of new talent. They were one of the few films in Hollywood that was willing to take some amount of risk with new talent and spend money on stuff the other studios didn't want to. And Mike DeLuca was a big part of making this happen. He was like the big driving force at New Line, helping them grow in this direction. And he saw... Muro is part of this. But when he and Edward Pressman first started talking about the film, they envisioned it as being like a seven or eight million dollar mid-level project that was going to be about the art and the aesthetic 
and they were going to let Stanley have have control of this medium-sized production. It would be just a bit bigger than what he had done before, and he'd have a chance to exercise that that vision that you were talking about, which is what he was all about. Right, and that could really propel him if done successfully in yeah. the industry, I yeah. think. Absolutely, and I think if this movie, and Pressman in interviews seems to agree, and I'm pretty sure he expresses as much in the Lost Souls documentary, Pressman seemed to feel the same way, that if it, rem- if it had remained that, if that's what the movie had stayed, and that's what it really should have stayed, that Stanley probably would have made a really nice, very visually pleasing adaptation of the story. But once they started working on it, it just immediately started getting in its own way, and unfortunately Mike DeLuca was a big part of that. They originally cast Bruce Willis and James Woods to play Moreau and Montgomery, the two biggest lead parts. I think it was uh, or Douglas. Two, or and Douglas and, and Murray, you're right. And uh, Willis ended up backing out after he got divorced or during his divorce from Demi, Demi Moore because he didn't want to leave the country um, to go film in Australia. And then... Uh, Plus he was buying up a whole town in Idaho called Haley. I don't know if you know that, but he was in the process of basically like acquiring all the buildings and land in this small Idaho town that he wanted to make his own. It was really weird. Anyway, go on. <laughs> right? So the casting from there, they think they've got Stanley thinks, Richard Stanley thinks he's got Bruce Willis and James Woods, these two parts. And then everything just starts derailing from there. Willis backs out. Mike DeLuca decides at some point that he wants Marlon Brando to be in the film to play Moreau. And no one talks to Richard Stanley about this at all. And when Richard Stanley gets a phone call to find out that they're we're trying to cast Brando in the same phone call, they're also like, by the way, we don't really want you to direct this movie anymore. We're going to get Roman Polanski. So Richard Stanley starts freaking out that he's being booted from this thing that he got off the ground. And New Line Cinema, even though one of their guys chose Brando, this is going to come back to haunt them later. New Line's other people immediately start fighting the casting of Brando. They had just worked with him on Don Juan DeMarco with Johnny Depp. He had been a huge problem for them the entire time. This dude had had already had a reputation for being difficult. He nearly destroyed Apocalypse Now, as amazing as that movie is. He was known for refusing to show up on work days at all, or he'd show up and then refuse to leave his trailer. He never learned his lines. He wanted them fed to him by somebody through an earpiece. This is something that remained constant until the day he died. The last 15 films he was in, he never even read the script. He would show up on the first day and just admit to the director, I never even fucking looked at this script. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm Marlon Um, Brando, bitch. Exactly. He was supposed to have read uh, Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, which is what Apocalypse Now is based on. When he showed up the first day, he's like, yeah, I never read that shit. And I'm not going to. People had to sit there and read it to him. That's insane. Right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff. So New Line had just finished working with him on, on Don Juan DeMarco, and they're like, no, no way. We do not want him back. We don't even care that he's Marlon Brando. And DeLuca kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, and he got the part. But then all of a sudden they need all this extra money to pay Brando. And then on top of that, now that Brando's in the movie, they want to make the film bigger. And this shit just starts getting worse and whereas now Brando thinks he's getting fired, so Richard, or I'm sorry, Stanley, Richard Stanley thinks he's getting fired. Richard Stanley responds by going to see a friend of his in London who he describes as a warlock. I'm being fucking serious. A, a magic user. A magic user, yeah. And Stanley has got this emergency meeting arranged with New Line's people to try to convince them to keep him as director. And he goes to see this warlock first, and he says, I need you to fix this. So the warlock says, yeah, I'll cast a spell for you, blah, blah, blah. Stanley goes to the meeting. The warlock casts the spell. I don't know what Richard Stanley actually said in this meeting, but somehow he convinces New Line to keep him. And he he's convinced that it's the warlock that did this for him. Well, doesn't he get... Marlon Brando on board to vouch for him? He does. He gets Brando. This is part of this whole complex thing, and it's part of why I'm going to defend Frankenheimer a bit later. Brando became way more difficult as per usual later, but Brando liked Richard Stanley, sort of. Richard Stanley went and talked to Brando before production and said, here's what's happening, and I want to do the movie, and this whole thing was my vision, and here's all this artwork I invented, and 
they're trying to fire me to bring on Roman Polanski, which I sort of thought that Brando would be on board with because he and Polanski had worked together on Last Tango in Paris. Although uh, Brando basically raped the woman on the set of that film and nothing ever happened. So maybe. What the maybe, fuck? Yeah. I mean, and on camera, on camera. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, Brando went to bat, and that's probably what made the difference. Stanley went to this meeting. He ends up keeping the job. But here, now, here's the weird part. Richard Stanley says that Brando loved his idea for the film and that Brando defended him as an extension of this meeting. But Richard Stanley also claims that he had to have the meeting at Brando's home because Brando refused to have the meeting outside the house. Stanley says he went to see Marlon Brando at this home he owned here in L.A. in a very exclusive neighborhood where a bunch of other actors lived. And he, Stanley claims that when he got to the house, the first thing Brando did was trot out these very large, aggressive-looking dogs and then a laser pointer, and that Brando started pointing the laser pointer at things and the dogs would attack whatever he was pointing the pointer at. And Stanley claims that Brando wanted to convince him that if he didn't like what, what he had to say, that he'd make the dogs eat him. So this is, this is where this, this is, and this is, they haven't even started making the movie yet. This is a pre-production meeting. Like, so Stanley on the one hand says, Brando loved my vision and defended me to the new line executives. But he also says, when I first got to Brando's house, he tried to make me think his dogs would eat me. Right. It's like uh, a power move. Right. right? Yeah, I, I think that was part of it. I think a lot of what Brando did on the set, frankly, was just to reinforce the idea that he could run the entire thing. Did he have his dick on the coffee table as well? <laughs> right? I'm kind of surprised he didn't. And then, like, so Stanley gets to keep his job, but Bruce Willis backs out. Stanley had convinced James Woods to take a part in the movie after meeting him. He then has to find replacements, so they get Brando... They get Kilmer, and Kilmer makes the budget blow up again and because he's a big star at this point. And Batman he's had just come out. Yeah, Batman had just come out, just come out. And so they decide they want to turn this into a real blockbuster, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, is a $35 million movie. Now, keep in mind, this started off being a medium-budget seven to $8 million production that probably wasn't going to have any A-list actors in it. Now it's big budget. Yeah. Now it's a $35 million movie with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer who just played fucking Batman. It's got the Godfather and Batman in it. Like, so this thing's getting out of control. Now, here's where things, the layers just keep going, okay? But still, like, this could work, right? This they could have work. the budget. They have the big names. This sounds like a grand slam, guys. Uh, what yeah. are you talking about? Right? And that's where everyone was at at this point. It still sounds like, even with Brando being weird and blah, 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 everyone thinks we can we can do this. Now, Here's where extra layers start to come in. Val Kilmer sort of has a reputation for being difficult, but it's really difficult from an outsider's perspective to suss out exactly how true that really is because there are instances where other people are telling stories about Kilmer's behavior where you're like, oh my God, yeah, Kilmer's the world's biggest asshole. But there are other instances where Kilmer tells his end in the story and you're like, well, wait, actually, I totally understand why he was behaving that way. So... It gets really weird. So you watch this documentary, Lost Souls. Richard Stanley says, Val Kilmer calls me on the phone and demands, demands that I come to Tokyo to meet him the morning before the Japanese premiere of Batman. And I go to Tokyo. And when I get to the meeting, Val Kilmer is acting like a gigantic asshole. And he demands even though he'd already signed a contract to be in the movie, that we reduce his shooting days by 40% because he's too busy to actually participate in the full schedule. This is the way Richard Stanley tells this story. And it turns into an argument. And Richard Stanley says, let me see what I can do. I'm going to go back and talk to New Line. Stanley comes back to, to California to talk to New Line. Kilmer at some point, without Richard Stanley knowing, also comes back to California. Kilmer then holds a meeting with the head of New Line Cinema at a restaurant in Bel Air and says, look, I know I just dragged your director to Tokyo and said I wanted my shooting schedule reduced by 40%, but actually, I just want to be released from the movie completely. I don't want to do it at all. I'm no longer interested. And you listen to these stories and it's like, Jesus, everything was true. Kilmer's the world's biggest fucking douchebag. But you listen to Kilmer's side of the story, and there it turns out there's details that get left out, of course, because it's fucking telephone. Kilmer found out 
via television news while he was in Japan on the Batman premiere that his wife was filing for divorce. So he calls his attorneys as an attorneys and his attorneys say, this shit's going to get ugly. You're going to be involved in a divorce proceeding for months, months, and it's going to cost you a huge amount of money. Kilmer had just signed on to be on Moreau. I don't think Kilmer was trying to be an asshole. I think Kilmer went to these people and really was trying to say, look, my wife filed for divorce without my even knowing about it. I found out from the television news while I was promoting a whole different movie. I don't really have time to do this anymore. Will you just let me out of the contract? It's interesting, though, that you say all this, Steve, because in the documentary Val made by Val Kilmer, he says that he was surprised by getting divorce papers on the set of Moreau. Yeah, no, see, that thing, and he's told that story multiple different ways because in the documentary, he says he got the papers while he was on Moreau and was surprised by it. But in another version, in in other interviews, he claims that he found out about the divorce on the TV while he was in Japan. So it's possible, though, that he's just making that last part up and trying to justify his behavior. Yes, and that's... This possible. Is, right, it's possible, possible. And this is part of why we're going to keep talking about this throughout. It's so hard because there's a lot of accusations in this film everywhere, everywhere. Val Kilmer was difficult. Richard Stanley was difficult. Feruza Balk was difficult. There's accusations that Frankenheimer was the most dictatorial director that anyone had ever had. And I'm going to touch more on that because there's a lot of background. But the reality is there was a lot going on here. These people, all of them, were both equally acting totally defensibly and also acting like undefensible assholes all at the same time. And some of what they did was totally understandable and other stuff was like, no, you're just being a huge prick. Right. And what ends up happening is it all gets blended together and you end up with this weird impression where it's like you don't know who's right and who was really being difficult and this shit just happens on sets. I mean, like, the entire crew ended up hating Ridley Scott by the time they were done shooting Blade Runner, and Scott probably did a lot of things wrong, but I, you know, at the same time, you listen to some of the other stories, and it's like, yeah, it wasn't really all his fault either. So, yeah, anyway, anyway, we're going to keep keep going here. So, Kilmer tries to get out of the part. They eventually give him the part of Montgomery instead of um, Douglas. Douglas, because giving him that part reduces his number of shooting days by enough to, to make the difference. They end up bringing in an actor named Rob Morrow initially to play um, Edward Douglas. Edward Douglas. He had Thank a different you. name in the original, but yeah, yeah it's Edward Douglas, Edward that Douglas. character. Um, Rob Morrow is not a guy a lot of people know by name, but you might recognize his face. He was on a really popular show in the 90s called Northern Exposure. He had also been in a Martin Scorsese film called Quiz Show in 93 or 94 that had been nominated for some Academy Awards. He was very good in it. So he was given a part. He ended up hanging around through part of the production, and the production got so awful and so out of control, he started calling his agent and even the new the head of New Line and just begging to be let go. And eventually they were just like, fine, just 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 go. They just let like, him go. Yeah. Val Kilmer also begged to be out of let go from his contract, yeah. but they didn't let him go. No, they couldn't. They couldn't afford to. If they'd let him go, it would have cost them too much. The, it would have killed the production. I mean, this is at a time when the, the movie star really gets the attention right that's what gets an audience to watch a movie is the star it's like oh it's the new val kilmer movie or the new tom cruise movie right it's not so much that way anymore but it used to be considering where this is all headed do you think it might have been a better idea to go ahead and kill the production right here now i think no right (laughs) i think i mean they, they probably logistically should have either just canceled it canned it and tried to write off what they what they'd spent or they should have put it on hold but richard stanley was smart enough to know and was probably probably right that if kilmer left or even if some of these other things did the film would have gone into turnaround and no one else would have wanted it and it would have just died in a studio vault somewhere and he was desperate just to get anything he could made which I can't really blame him for at this point. But, I, mean, I mean, they haven't even gotten to shooting yet. They, have, they didn't lose Rob Morrow until after shooting had started. But they, then some of the people involved in production are watching a Spanish-language TV show where they see a little man named Pedro de la Rosa, who at the time is... Nelson. The, yeah. At the time is the smallest living person on the planet. And... He's doing a, a dance number. This guy was, was famous in Latin America. Yeah, he's he was like two and a half feet tall. He's tiny. Yeah. yeah. 
And he, he'd show up on Latin American shows and he would dance and he would do this other stuff and he'd mess around with the host and he'd love him. And apparently in real life, this is not me, just my perception. I'll put a phrase it to you this way. He would use his sister who spoke fluent English as his translator and she was with him the entire time on production. He spent most of his downtime saying the most horrifically perverse things that would come to his mind to the women on the set to the point where his sister would often refuse to translate for him because of how disgusting he was being. And she would tell the women on set that, yeah, he's very sexual. He's basically a pervert. That was this dude's gig. He's just this little weirdo. And little fucking freak. Right? <laughs> of course he was. Like, it's right? just, it seems like a stereotype. <laughs> right? But the people who see him on TV decide that they have to find a spot in the movie for him, and they initially give him a little background part. He's supposed to stand around somewhere and just be a character. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of room for, like, you know, I hate to use this word, but, like, deformed people <laughs> right. to play extras in this movie, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then just due to the nature of what this movie is. Yeah, absolutely. And And he gets to set, and at some point later on, Marlon Brando sees him and decides he loves him so much, even though this little guy speaks no English at all and can't really be given any lines. He decides he loves this little guy so much, he starts demanding that they write a more substantial part for him into the script, and they start giving him little bits that were supposed to be for other characters, and there's other people now who are losing screen time to have this guy on. Yeah, there's a character in this movie that I really like called Maling. He's like one of the servants in the main house, one of the mutant men. Is he the bellhop-looking beastman? Yeah, yeah, he's the Legolas guy. Okay, yeah. And his name's <laughs> Marco Hofschneider. Apparently, a lot of his role went to this little guy. Like, he yes. was supposed to be, like, Marlon Brando's right hand, but instead they made it this little clone mini-me guy. Yes, yeah. I mean, the whole thing is really crazy, and so throughout the film, he's doing a bunch of weird stuff. And Moro is eventually gone, so they ended up getting David Thules. Thule, Thule, Thules or Thulis? I can remember. Thules. Thules, yeah. Who, funnily enough, had actually been Richard Stanley's first choice for that part. For whatever reason, they hadn't been able to get him. Thulis was having a pretty good time uh, in the last, in the two years or so in the lead up to this. He'd been in an Academy in, in an Academy Award nominated film called Restoration. He did a voice for James and the Giant Peach, which is one of the finest stop motion animation films ever. He also uh, got a bit part in The Big Lebowski. It's pretty awesome. He, he had a lead role in Dragonheart, which I think he had just finished filming right before going to this. Yeah, I really like David Thewlis. I think yeah. he's like really charming. I like to see him on screen. He's not like an A-lister, no. but he's he's really great in the things I do see him in. Yeah. And a very interesting thing that caught my attention, Steve, is that in the whole documentary, this hour and a half documentary on the island of Dr. Moreau, his name is not said once. Yeah. Yeah. I think that he was just kind of there and getting along with everyone as well as he could and, and trying to get through it. You know, it, in Val's documentary, there's a couple of moments between the two of them, which is nice to see, but yeah. But they seem like they kind of have a good rapport. Yeah, they do. Two, yeah. And um, I mean, that's another thing that makes it harder. You watch that and there are moments in it where it looks like Kilmer and Brando were getting along super well. And then there are other reports from other places where Brando was being shitty even to Kilmer and the two of them weren't getting along. There's one... One story that gets told in the Lost Souls documentary where the two of them hoarded themselves up in their trailers and neither of them would come out until the other one had. But like, the, the, you know, the, I think Kilmer claimed later on that that wasn't really true. I don't know. I, or, a lot of production crew validated that story. And I, I am willing to bet that that is true and the, because it was a battle of egos a lot of the time right. on set. But I've also heard another variation of that story where Kilmer and Brando were both so fed up with how screwed up the production was that the two of them agreed with each other to do it beforehand and just didn't want to come out to deal with anything. Either, so either like, way, they're still like costing yeah, a exactly. day of production just right. because they're unhappy. Yeah, you know, and Brando on multiple days literally just didn't show up at all. In fact, there's a moment in Val's documentary where he's showing Brando's double being drug out in a sort of canopy thing from, from Brando's introductory scene of the movie. And they're all commenting to each other that none of them knew that Brando wasn't going to be there that day. And it's because it wasn't planned. Brando just decided that morning he didn't feel like showing up for work. But that was a whole another thing is Brando was difficult, notoriously difficult anyway. To his credit, I guess, he had a daughter who committed suicide like two months before he showed up for production. 
So he's also all messed up over that. Which yeah. You can't blame him for. But he's also difficult when his daughter's alive, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. So anyway, they get through all of this, and they ended up with they end up with David Thewlis and Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, and they're trying to get the production underway, and they're trying to get the film started, but. There's already been all this background difficulty and just problems with the casting and problems getting Kilmer there and worries about what Brando is going to do. And the production keeps going up in size and up in crew and up in cost and Richard Stanley. And there's natural disasters. Yeah. At one point they lose part of the set to a storm and like Richard Stanley can't handle it. I'm so I'm not even trying to be shitty, but he just, he can't, he's not there for it mentally. And what he needed was a much smaller production. And he starts withdrawing more and more and more and more and more. And they're, they're in this isolated part of Australia. And, and it gets to the point where, according to the other crew members, he's not even communicating with people verbally. He's been making up his own drawings. They're not even full storyboards. They're just drawings. And he's been making photocopies of them and turning them into booklets. And on a day-to-day basis, he's just walking around the set distributing these little photocopied booklets to the crew, basically saying, here's what I want. And when they ask him for any more input, it's like, nah, you've got the drawing. He's not giving proper direction. That was one of the things that the cast and crew noted. Right. So like they would be blocking a scene and he wouldn't exactly be telling people what to do. Right. Right. So, and that's what a director does. He tells people what to do. Yeah. I mean, it's your responsibility. It's, the director is supposed to be there with the artist to get the storyboards, storyboards made. And then part of his job later on is to express those storyboards to the actors in a way that they can get what the intent was. And like, he's just not doing any of it. And one of the, one of their complaints later on, Kilmer and Brando and Fruza Balk as well, and Thulis, all of them really. One of their complaints later on was that they couldn't get Frankenheimer to stop and talk about blocking and stuff with them, which was a problem they'd also had with 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 Stanley. But one of the things I one of my defenses of Frankenheimer is that by the time he got there, the production was already so a mess and so falling apart, and the studio didn't even care what they got. They just needed a finished product. Frankenheimer had been told by the studio heads, you don't have time for anything except to just get the movie made. And I think he felt these people had been there long enough on the set and knew well enough what their parts were that that he could just say, look, here's what the scene is. Read the script and give me your impression of it. I think that's really what Frankenheimer wanted. And, and I do think that he expressed that verbally. But I also think that some of the actors felt that that was a slight and they were basically being told, I don't have time for you. And the unfortunate reality was Frankenheimer didn't really didn't have time for them. And and it's not what I've heard about him in regards to other films. If you look at like the commentary for Ronan and other movies, they talk about him being way more involved in that. So I, I think it was a difficult situation for everyone, him included. And he ended up acting a lot, even more gruff because he was known to be gruff. He was. But he acted even more gruff than he would have because he was stuck into this this mess of a production that was already going on. And all these people were doing these things and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and so, so. so the transition of, of Stanley to Frankenheimer. So we, we're kind of in the middle of that right now in this point in the production, Steve. Right. So how did it go from Stanley to Frankenheimer? So Stanley just became more and more and more disconnected and it was causing more and more problems and delays. And in Stanley's defense, the difficulties presented by the crew or the, by the cast was not helping. At one point, Kilmer and Stanley apparently got into an argument so vehement that Kilmer told Stanley that Kilmer said something to the effect of the director's place is behind the camera. So why don't you get back behind the camera? And the crew people were calling the executives at New Line and saying Stanley can't control this production. He's or, being pushed around yeah, by Val Kilmer. Right. Is he not? He is. He is being, and, and by Brando too. And frankly, you can't really even hold him accountable for it because this guy's – look, Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer are not going to respect this dude. He's never done anything else. Like it doesn't matter how good he is. You know, Brando can't show up and do that with Scorsese. Brando can't show up and do that with with Stanley Kubrick. But he can do it with Richard Stanley. He, I mean, Brando was trying it with bigger directors too, but especially someone like Stanley. So yeah, he's being pushed around. The crew is calling the studio and saying, 
You know, he can't handle it. He's being pushed around. He doesn't even know how to manage a production this size anyway. And the actor's behavior is just making it worse. Plus, a couple things, though. No one's really having his back on this production, it seems like. No. Like, the other crew is not, like, helping him wrangle the actors in the way that they probably should, like ADs and such. Right. So, like, that's, like, not really fair, No, and Stanley doesn't have enough experience or really, frankly, the balls in his own right to get up and, and... really fight by himself. He needed that support. There was almost no one there giving it to him. And you're right about that. And then, you know, then Rob Morrow, who had already been there working, is calling the executives at New Line saying, I don't want to be here anymore. It's so fucked up. Nobody here knows what they're doing, blah, blah. And they end up having to let him go and recast Thulis in the part. And eventually the head of New Line said, we need somebody here who's just going to come in and make this movie. Because otherwise, we're going to shut it down, and it's literally never going to get finished. It, it's just going to get vaulted, and we'll write it off. Well, they they have like a money problem, right? Because yeah. Because they spent enough money to where it has to be made, even if it flops, to make enough money back, right? Yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. And this is the same problem 25 or 30 years before that 20th Century Fox had been in with Cleopatra. This is the kind of thing that sinks studios especially medium-sized studios like New Line, as successful as they were. It only took two or three bombs to destroy Carol Co. 20th Century Fox had to sell a third of the property they owned in LA because Cleopatra fucked them up so bad. People thought the studio was going to go bankrupt. So yeah, New Line needed to get something made. And Frankenheimer, for whatever criticisms we might have, and I would admit up front, he probably was even more gruff with these people than he really needed to be. That's a gentle but, euphemism. But no, I don't I don't think it is. And I think that frankly, I'm gonna be shitty here for a minute. I'm sorry, Corey, but you've never been on a set. You've oh, never, I see how it is. You've never you've an argument never, from authority. <laughs> well You don't know what it's like. <laughs> it's not even an argument from authority, it's an argument from experience. Like you don't know what it's like until there. You, you're there. You don't know what the politics are like until you're there. I've been on a set with with uh, some very, very difficult people before, and I, I can tell you it only takes one of them to shut the whole thing down. Does it, his name rhyme with Bysmore? Yes, it does. It does. Um, and things that people like Bysmores do <laughs> result in police being called to set. They result in lawsuits after the fact. They result in days of production being lost. You know, like at some point, if you're the director, I don't care if you're the nicest guy in the world, Spielberg will scream at people. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going to get to a point where you're backed into a corner and it's just like, I don't care about being nice to you anymore. You're going to do the job you're fucking being paid for or one of us is quitting. Frankenheimer, again, probably could have been more polite and I'm not saying he was always right, but he was an old school director. He'd come from an old school. He'd been around since the 50s. He was he had a reputation for working with people who were difficult, which is why New Line wanted him in the first place. You say whatever you want. New Line didn't pick Frankenheimer by accident. It's not like he's the cheapest. It was not a pay scenario. It wasn't he's available and no one else is. They did ask a couple other directors who didn't want to involve themselves in the problem. I want you to take these actors and I want you to spank them. <laughs> right. Right, but Frankenheimer did have a reputation for getting the project made even with people who were not nice to deal with. And I'm going to I'm going to dive one more level into this real quick. One of the actors big complaints is that he wouldn't listen to their input about the script. But Brando went to him like 3 days into into his being there and said, "I want you to shut the whole project down." He actually said this. He told Frankenheimer, "Let's just shut the movie down and rewrite the whole script ourselves." And and when when he told Brando we're not going to do that, Brando got angry about it and started telling everyone he wouldn't hear my input. When he did listen to Brando's ideas, one of the ideas he got, I'm being deadly serious, one of the ideas he got was that we should rewrite the ending of the movie so that Muro is a dolphin. Muro is a dolphin? Yeah, Muro is a dolphin. A dolphin man hybrid. A dolphin man hybrid. That was that was one of Brando's ideas. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. If I could give a standing ovation, I would. Right. There's a part in the film, we'll oh. touch on it in a minute, where Brando is wearing a bucket on his head. That wasn't in the original script. The bucket was Brando's idea. Brando Brando initially claimed that he thought it would be a nice little touch 
because it was his way of keep Miro's way of keeping cool. They had to find a bucket on set and cut a hole in it because Brando wanted that on his head. Brando, Brando then starts saying that he still believes in the Dolphin Man idea. And the reason he likes the bucket is because he believes that Miro's got a blowhole hidden under it and that the ice going into the bucket is feeding the blowhole. Like, these people are running around besmirching John Frankenheimer, saying he won't listen to our ideas. These are the ideas. Like, Besmirch it, the good name of John Frankenheimer. These bad shit, crazy ideas. These coke field ideas. It was a good name. This is one of the most critically acclaimed directors of his era. I'm not saying he's the best ever or he's on the same level as name your other big director, but he was a serious, critically acclaimed director. Lots of awards. I mean, and I'm not just talking about the mass market bullshit Oscars. I'm talking about Directors Guild Awards, Writers Guild Awards, awards that are really given by the industry. Like, <clears throat> So you're right. I've never been on a set, so no, there is that level of disconnect. Would I you say that Feruza Balt has ever been on a movie set? Well, yeah. Feruza and, Balk, I mean. And, well, and Balk, but Balk's another one. Like, when, when the actors, Val Kilmer has a reputation for being difficult. He had a problem with John Frankenheimer. Marlon Brando has a reputation for being difficult. He had a problem with John Frankenheimer. Feruza Balk had a difficult for being emotional and a little difficult. And when she got upset at the way the film was going, she had a production assistant drive her like 500 miles to the other side of the country so that she could get on a plane and leave. And her agent had to force her to go back. So yeah. she's saying that John Frankenheimer is difficult. Look, Franken she said he was beyond difficult. She, she didn't just say he was difficult, like he was mean. She said like... She described it as borderline violence. Right, but, the, I mean, she's also clearly quite melodramatic. And what, what qualifies as borderline violence? Did he hit someone? Like, did he threaten to hit someone? I mean, Val Kilmer tried... I mean, would you say, like, someone, like, screaming in your face is, like, a violent act? I mean, a little bit, yeah, but, I mean, A, there's no footage of that, so I have no idea what she considers to be screaming in her face. Number two... Picks her, it didn't happen. Right, well, I mean, partly, yeah, but I'm, I'm, two, she does seem prone to exaggerating. Three, like, it happens. I, adults everywhere. You get into a fight, two people are screaming at each other. It, it's not nice. It's not pleasant. Both people were wrong, but it happens. I mean, hell, there was a story in the news 10 years ago or so about one father who punched another father to death at a Little League game because they got into an argument so bad. So, like, holding Frankenheimer up as some huge example of being the world's biggest prick as he yelled at somebody on a set it's like I see. You so know, he, he didn't kill someone, so it's you know. Well, okay, so good. what your your point people is? People have he, done worse so, things. Okay, so your point is he yelled at Feruza Balk twice, so he <laughs> must be the worst, meanest director in the history of mankind. Like, I'm well, that, sorry, that's just but, one account, right? Isn't there like a whole account of like the cast and crew like similarly well, advocating for uh, those kinds of stories? Almost all the complaints I heard were mostly from the cast members who wanted to use up his time talking about Miro being a dolphin man, like Val Kilmer's defense for this is an audio clip in the documentary where he's arguing with Frankenheimer. Val Kilmer says something to the effect of, I feel unsafe on set because you threatened to quit. That's what he's, that's his big thing, that Frankenheimer threatened to quit. And Frankenheimer's response is, I will quit if the group of you don't start fucking behaving yourself. You know, John Frankenheimer can say action cut all day long and it will never make him a director. <laughs> Okay, uh, this has just gone too far. I can't do it. If we're gonna work this way. Okay. Shut the video camera off. Are we rehearsing? We are about to rehearse. Would you please shut the video camera off? No, because I'm in a highly emotional state because you said earlier to David and I you're gonna leave this movie. If this continues, I will not, I do not see how I can function under these conditions. I'm supposed to be doing creative work, but this is not conducive to creating a good scene. Well, okay, you can I have a minute because I'm in an emotional state. Sir. I won't be please. able to read my own. Well, I don't need to please have a minute. I'll tell you what, when you guys are ready to rehearse. I'm ready to rehearse right now. Did you shut the video camera off? I need a witness because of things you've said. Things that I have said? Yeah. You have debated in front of your two lead actors of whether you will continue to direct this film. That puts me in a state of mind, not conducive to creating. Please shut the video camera off. I will keep it on until we're rehearsing.
You're right about that. Val Kilmer tried to like really paint Frankenheimer as the bad guy right. and, and himself as the good guy. Yes. And he couldn't really. And that's, that's when my book, my point here isn't Frankenheimer was right to let himself go and yell. But my point here is he was up against the law. These other people were really pushing him. The yelling is kind of understanding. And it fucking hit George Kukor. I think it was Kukor, really famous director. I mean, I, my grandfather had a story about him going off somebody. Maybe it wasn't Kukor. I don't want to besmirch his memory, but I've heard so many of these stories about directors making people cry, fucking sob into their hands because they got yelled at. And then two years later, it turns out they're best friends or like, you know, he was mean to me on the set, but they've worked on four movies together. And it's like, well, then why do you keep going back? You know, I'm, this shit, I'm just saying this shit happens. I think Frankenheimer's been painted into an unfair corner on the basis of that, just like I was saying before, I think even Kilmer's reputation, he was definitely difficult. Here's, here's another underline. Several of the people on the production of this film swear to God that Kilmer was in such a bad mood one day that he purposefully burned a crew member with a cigarette. Right. He put a cigarette out like on someone's face. We didn't put it out, but like he burned their hair off their face, yeah. right? And if Jesus you look at the Christ? And if you look at it on IMDb, the IMDb entry claims that he straight up just put it out on someone. Now, who knows what's actually true? That's part of the problem here. None of us really knows what's true. Well, it sounds like that's an interpretation of the actual story, which yeah. people on set said that he was like burning right. the cigarette out on someone's mutton chops. So here's Kilmer's documentary where his defense for how bad Frankenheimer was as a, as a director is two minutes of them arguing over Frankenheimer having threatened to quit because the actors won't behave. Val Kilmer, in his documentary, never mentions, oh, by the way, I burned someone with a cigarette. And he also you know? never says that he was basically feuding with with Brando, yeah. which like everyone on the set says was happening. The it was only, like the battle of egos between yeah. those two, even before Frankenheimer showed up. The only moments he shows in his documentary of Brando are moments where they were getting along, like him talking to Brando while Brando was lounging around in the, um, what, what do you call the hanging bed? It's thing? a hammock. Hammock, there you go. Yeah, so, you know, this is, I, I just don't think... Any of these harsh judgments, it's probably partly true. They all deserve a little bit. Frankenheimer yelled too much, was probably gruffer than he needed to be. Kilmer was being an asshole. Brando was being an asshole. Fruza Bulk was being overdramatic. Like, the, the, it was a difficult production. Frankenheimer had a job. Like, this whole thing is just so fucked. Every bit of it is so fucked. But you know what? But I didn't hear any complaints about Tamura Morrison. How do you do, sir? I'm Mrs. Zello. <laughs> that's nope. true I didn't hear I have not seen one person say anything bad about Tamura Morrison in this movie and nobody said anything bad about uh, Hellboy Ron Perlman yeah fuck yeah, yeah bro right, so, so they're cool the, the monsters were like <laughs> I shouldn't call them monsters the actors that played the monsters right the animal hybrid men the beastmen they weren't really known for acting up on set necessarily but they kind of like got held there longer than they expected to be. It was expected to be a few yeah. weeks, turned into like six to eight months. Six weeks was and, supposed to be six months, yeah. And they would just party hard after shooting, right? Yeah, this is going to what Josh was talking about. The actors were there for so much longer that mo they got to the point where they were just living, smoking weed, having parties, that some of the bigger cast members would show up occasionally. And yeah, they're all living in this kind of remote part of Australia. It must have been very interesting. I mean, you hear about that kind of thing Sometimes, but it's usually in cases like, like with the Lord of the Rings movies where they were filming them all or three of them at once and they had to live in New Zealand for like a year and a half. That's, that's the kind of situation, but it was intentional, you know, or the second and third Back to the Future movies where they shot them at the same time, but they did it on purpose. This movie was like, yeah, we only need you in Australia for six weeks and these people are living there for six months. Yeah. <laughs> and in isolation, kind of like probably going crazy, like witnessing a lot of drama and then like really cutting loose at night. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't blame them. They're all getting paid and they're all getting a per diem, which is awesome. One of the guys, oh God, who was it? The cinematographer or the production coordinator in the Lost Souls documentary, you can see it. Whoever it was, you'll see him say it, saying that he was getting this per diem, but they're getting fed on set and the studio is paying for them to live somewhere and he's getting his normal salary on top of the per diem. So they were just spending the per diem on anything. You think he bought a giant like Skelectrix race set, little race car set yeah. or something. Some they were just playing with it in a hotel room. They would just spend the money on bullshit. So this is part of the problem for New Line. It's like every day people are there, they're just spending all this money on whatever. Well, that's their money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's their money, but it's, you know, it's their money that 
the studio wouldn't have had to spend to pay them if this if they'd only been there for six weeks, you know? <laughs> yeah. Ugh. So how does it go from there, Steve? Gee, they get hit by a hurricane, which washes washes away part of the set. So st- when Stanley got fired, he finds out Frankenheimer's coming in. The studio goes to him and the execs, they call him and they say, we'll pay you the entire fee and we won't bug you about everything that happened. We'll buy you a nice plane ticket back to London, but you have to agree to just take your money in the plane ticket and go home. Yeah, they want him out of the fucking country. Yeah, and they were afraid he was going to do something to the set. And the funny thing is, this goes back to what we were just talking about. The producers were afraid he was going to do something on the set because of a, a rumor that was based on a joke. He, he, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he'd made some passing joking comment to somebody about lighting a bomb or torching part of the set. He was like, burn this place down. Yeah, you know, and it wasn't serious, but that turned into a rumor and the producers heard later on that he might cause trouble. And they really thought that he was going to freak out. The one thing that he did do when he found out they were firing him is he went back and got all of his notes and his artwork and shredded it all. And that included binders. <laughs> it was raining so much there. There was a big chunk of the time they couldn't shoot. And they had... um They'd, they'd spent weeks putting together a little calendar of like when the rain was most common so they could try to shoot around it. And he shredded all that stuff just to try to set them back to, <laughs> to square one. After that, he, Bitter. Took, right? he takes the money then and he disappears. He's supposed to go to the airport, but the studio finds out that he's supposed to leave. He never got on a plane. So there's a few weeks where nobody knows, well, mostly nobody knows where the fuck he is. And, um, you find out after the fact, they were worried the whole time he was going to trash the set. Find out after the fact he'd spent a couple of weeks living on a farm somewhere nearby in Australia. He'd found land owned by somebody who was willing to let him camp. And he camped there for a while. And two of the crew guys, like on a day off, bumped into him. And they brought him back. And they managed to sneak him in with a group of animal extras and got him a an animal head. And... He ended up working on the movie for several days as an extra with an animal mask on. So he's in the movie. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> right? He's in the background. He's in the movie in several scenes as a background extra. He would not speak while he was there so that nobody would recognize his voice. He wouldn't take the mask off. He would skip lunch so he wouldn't have to take it off to eat. And um, nobody found out until the last day of shooting when he pulled the head off and people <laughs> freaked out freaked out on the set. But he never trashed anything, which is pretty funny. It was old man Stanley all along. <laughs> right, he had such a bad bad experience. He didn't do any other work for like five years after this, but did eventually get back. Feruza Balk, like I said, was so upset when she found out. This is another thing, man. Like I don't dislike her. I don't think she's like actually crazy, but I do think she's like emotional. She had hated working with him and talks about it like she was looking for a way to get out of the movie anyway. But then when she found out he got fired, she was so upset that the studio had removed him. She got into a car, she grabbed a guy, a PA or someone, and just demanded that he drive her to Sydney. She didn't understand that Sydney was three or 400 miles away. So he drove her like six hours to Sydney to get to an airport. And at the airport, she has a phone conversation with her agent. The agent says, if you come back to the US, the studio is literally going to make sure you never work on another movie ever again. And it's well within their power to do it. And that's what made her go back to set. And I thought she was uh, getting along okay with Stanley, and that she I, was upset when he left because she got along with him. I think that's mostly what it's. I don't. I don't think she liked being there. I don't think she liked the project, but I do think she was sympathetic to him, and it was really a reaction to how sure her her perception that he was being mistreated rather than it wasn't. I love this project. It was really more. I just you guys shouldn't have done that to him, but now he's been fired, and it's an opportunity for me to leave out of protest. So I'm going to do it. But so kind of like making an, an excuse. Yeah, I think a little bit. I think a little bit, you know, and again, like, I don't have a problem with her, but she definitely seems like she's kind of a character in her own right. But yeah, so anyway, I, that's really the larger part of what I thought was worth touching on. I, I You know, it's a really, really uh, fucked up production. 
none of the people on the crew said this. I just want to slip it in. I was going to wait till the end. We, we haven't even really discussed the actual film yet, but <laughs> one of the IMDb trivia facts, and I hope to God this was put in by somebody who worked on the movie, just, just says that Marlon Brando had a lot of pizzas in his van. <laughs> Interesting. Dude, the IMDb facts are weird. One of them says that like Marlon Brando being known for his excessive appetite would eat tons of cabbage. So that when yeah. he had scenes with Val Kilmer, he would like lay these nasty ass farts right. just to annoy Val Kilmer. Yeah. And yeah, like, I, I, I don't know where that came from, but right. I really hope it's fucking true. I mean, in that, like, I know it was enough of a joke that there's even an episode of The Simpsons where Bart briefly out of desperation takes a job working as an international career. And at one point, his boss asks him if he wants to deliver several crates of Big Macs to Marlon Brando's private island. But... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy to, God damn. I mean, I don't even, I can't make fun of the guy for it, but man, he got really big over a period of years. Anyway. I mean, Marlon Brando in this movie, his character lived on through South Park. Do you remember Dr. <laughs> Mephisto? Yes. yes. And he has a little guy named Kevin in the early right. South Parks. I don't know if that's a still a relevant character. No, that character, character faded away. Yeah. But that was a, a Marlon Brando, Dr. Moreau idea. And then, you know, obviously Mini-Me and Moreau in this movie. We'll talk more about that. I think we're about ready to get into this movie, are we not? Yeah, let's just do it. I mean, the, the great part about this movie is that it's only an hour and 35 minutes long, and it really does move quickly. That's, that's the best part. I'm going to respectfully disagree. This felt like two and a half hours. Really? D this felt so long to me. Nah, Funny, man. maybe that's because I've seen it before. But yeah, I'm on kind of with Corey. Well, I'll get into it more in the review part. But this movie, the, one of the things I'll say about it is it, it just felt like it snapped by for me. It didn't didn't last long. Josh, how does the island of Doctor Moreau open? Okay, so we're we're first treated with what I th suspect to be sound effects from Mortal Kombat Annihilation. <laughs> <laughs> And we get the the opening credits, but after that we're introduced to Edward Douglas, our main posh English character. I guess fresh after a plane crash, uh, they said, and him and two other guys are just hanging out on a raft, and the dudes are like battling to the death. One of them starts giving the other one like 100 stab. <laughs> Our plane crashed in the endless southern Pacific and we drifted for days between life and death. On the sixth or seventh day, the two men who had survived with me began to fight over the last canteen of water. Where did you watch this movie, Josh? I watched it on my computer. <laughs> oh, I see. I think I can read between the lines there. Steve, where did you watch this movie? For this viewing? Yeah. Uh, via Amazon. On I watched TV. it on Amazon as well. Yeah. So I think it's very important to note that this is not the version of the movie that I grew up with. It's not the same as the DVD. It's right. not the same as the VHS. <laughs> there are some changes to the violence. Yeah. And it's noticeable to me immediately. Because Edward Douglas is on the raft. He there was in a plane crash. There's two other guys on there. And they start stabbing each other. But in the Amazon version, you don't see him stabbing each other. Yeah. And then they fall off the raft. And then in the extended version, in the actual version, which you don't see on Amazon, one of them tries to get back on the raft. And Edward Douglas beats him to death with an oar. Yeah, that's the version I watched. Did you, not, you guys not get to see that? That was not present in the Amazon version. It yeah, looks they, like they toned down the violence. There was a director's cut version of that movie, but I think that's all it was, was a few extra moments of violence. Was the other guy still eaten by a shark? A shark shows up, and then it's, yeah. it's assumed that he's eaten by a shark. Oh, no. That one moment, 
I, the movie's almost better without it because he spends the rest of the movie being so horrified by what he sees on the island. It's like, well, you murdered a dude. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck your problem is. You murdered a man with an oar. Yeah, you know, without the murder, it's like, oh, okay, I can see why this non-murderer would be horrified by what he's seeing. <laughs> no. <laughs> What do you think, Steve, of those uh, opening credits? Is that, like, late 90s, chaotic, like, enough for you? Yeah, I mean, very cliche, no real effort. I mean, I think by the time they got to the design for the credit sequence, they were just like, make this a movie and release it all fucking ready. Just get it out. It reminds me of, like, Stigmata. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Oh, God, I was just thinking about that movie. Where it's just, like, chaos. Oh, it reminded me of the opening of the House on Haunted Hill remake for some reason. That's right. Dude, yes, that's the one. I swear to God, Gabriel Byrne has played the human incarnation of Satan in, like, five separate movies. (laughs) It's so weird, anyway. So our our main guy, who's played by David Dulles, is Edward Douglas. He's on this raft, you know, he's basically on his own. He's seemingly going to die out here just floating around the Java Sea in this raft. But he gets picked up by a boat. And Steve, that's where we see Montgomery, who I guess kind of rescues him, right? He hydrates yeah. him. He takes him to an island where he lives. And the yeah. idea is, he says, I'll get you to a radio. I just got to fix it up. You know, we can have some people come and pick you up. But for now, you got to come stay with us. Steve, he breaks a poor rabbit's neck. He does. He uh, uh, I don't really understand that scene. I'll be honest. I've never understood that scene. I, I don't really. I, I guess other than Montgomery's already a little unhinged at that point, and we're we're gonna watch the rest of it happen. But yeah, Montgomery kills a bunny just to make a point, and then. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I I understand why story wise. If you want me to get into it. Yeah, I mean, go go for it. So. They bring in exotic animals from this boat, right? He takes a cage of rabbits yeah. to the island, obviously for experimentation. But he kills one of them, and on this island, everyone is vegan. There's no killing animals allowed. Right. The reason he does it is because they now have this special guest here, which he can use as an excuse to eat Oh, meat. to have rabbit. Yeah, I guess you're right. That's what it is, because they do serve it later. And you know what? You're right, because... What's his name? The butler says that the rabbit was Montgomery's request. So that's as a zello, sir. <laughs> right? Yeah, and Brando's upset to see it. So yeah, he kills the rabbit, and then he takes uh, what's his name, Douglas, Edward up, Douglas, Edward up there, up to the main area, and he sort of explains that like this island's had multiple owners, and at one point Japanese investors bought it and built a resort there, but the resort failed, and then Muro moved in because he wanted an isolated place to do pioneering medical work that for whatever reason he couldn't do elsewhere yeah and it's explained innocently enough he's like you know animal activists wouldn't let him do his genetic experiments in the usa and he kind of like puts it really lightly he's like you know it got to a point where you couldn't even cage a rat without reading it its rights (laughs) right so it seems like innocent enough right when you put it in that framework yeah i mean val's got painted on white shorts he seems innocent (laughs) <laughs> and they they kind of vaguely paint <laughs> Montgomery as being this formerly brilliant neurosurgeon. He does say at one point that he wrote a paper that got Moreau's attention, and that's how the two of them met to begin with. But otherwise, it mostly just seems like Montgomery's there to do shit work. It's like he could have found a veterinary tech to do most of this, but fine. All right, you know. Yeah, like all the, like the the labor, like the fixing things around the compound, like feeding people yeah which we'll, we'll get into a little bit yeah no we need a brain surgeon to do the day-to-day duties <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i need yeah, a I, fucking brain surgeon i'm gonna have you feed some animals so i really need a candidate who's familiar with the uh i don't know the oblongata <laughs> <laughs> the medulla oblongata. <laughs> <laughs> uh. josh yes Edward Douglas is kind of looking around the compound, and he's seeing Moreau's credentials, and it's innocent enough. It seems pretty empty, right? There's not a lot of people around. So far, we just have met Montgomery, who's Val Kilmer. And as is the typical trope in every single movie where someone is told not to move, he immediately walks away from that spot. Well, I guess I'm going to fucking venture out. I don't give a fuck. This never doesn't happen. Every single time, I'm sick of seeing it. Every time the character starts saying, don't move or don't leave this spot, you'll know immediately, like, the person's going to move. Well, Val Comer, like, tells him to wait for him while he goes and puts on his, like, finest Hawaiian skirt. Yeah, (laughs) right? He says, stay right here. 
And of course, immediately Thulis is like, well, that must mean go wander outside and find the dancing girl. Josh, we see Aisa, don't we? Oh, dude, this is the finest Feruza Bog has probably ever been. Uh, she's looks fantastic in this. Uh, someone hasn't seen the craft. I was going to say the same. <laughs> oh, no, I have. Yeah, no, I have. I think she right. partially, like, kind of outdoes it in this movie, which is say it a lot. She is pretty hot. Yeah. yeah, doing the belly dancing, it's pretty dope. So why is her accent? And by extension, why is Marlon Brando's accent? Because I guess she's like his daughter, but in quotations, why do they have these accents? And why is uh, Marlon Brando's just so atrocious? Right? Yeah, I've got an accent that's half England, half Locust Valley Lockjaw, even though I was raised on an island in the fucking Java Sea. It's a cat accent. Oh, it's... clearly it's feline. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, you know, it figures that they would cast Ruz a bulk to play the pussy. <laughs> oh good lord <gasps> she Sorry. wasn't feline very good that day <laughs> zing uh. honestly though I really do like her cat like behavior when yeah. she meets him like she, she, she's she, like, she like puts her face up to his hands like a cat would do she looks it too she's got that very kind of feline type there's an exotic look. look about her yeah yes. she's really pretty absolutely who are you I, uh, I just got here. I came on the boat this morning with uh, Montgomery. Come from the sea? Well, originally I'm from England. England? That's another island. Yes. I've read about it in many books. My name's Edward Douglas. Edward Douglas. You have such beautiful hands. <laughs> so beautiful. Oh, thank you. So, right after this, Val locks. What a bland name Edward Douglas is. Can we just talk about that? Like, I didn't even catch this goddamn son of a bitch's name for my entire first viewing. I had to go back and catch it on the second viewing. <laughs> But he gets locked into this room for like, I don't know, 20 minutes? And then one paper clip later, he's out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes you kind of wonder how it is they keep anything alive, secured in this place, considering it's that easy to just get out. Where, where There's paper clips in his bedroom? Like, they have, like, yeah. stationary equipment in there? There's, like, notepads and paper clips? Where yeah, did he get right? that? It's a letter opener. What guest in this room is going to need, yeah, letter openers, paper clips? Here's a stapler. He's going to be a filing shit. like Paper shredders in the closet, <laughs> you know. Do you need a filing cabinet while you're here? <laughs> Xerox is in the next room. <laughs> like. Yeah, Josh, he breaks out. And uh, maybe you can tell us about, like, what he sees when he does break out. The Gerber baby. I'm trying to figure out a way to describe the way I felt during this scene. Happy. Yeah, bro, relive it, please. Uh, it was... I felt much like... Uh, I almost called him Edward Blake. Edward Douglas, <laughs> what a bland fucking name. I was in shock, wonder, and mostly bafflement as he comes across what I can only describe as Beastman. A look like a cross between Steve, hopefully you get these uh, Keanu Reeves from Freaks and <laughs> Ice-T from Tank Girl. Oh my god! Yeah, with the big ears? Yes! Oh, yes! Oh my god, uh. it's like a cross between the, the, the Beastmen. I was completely in Boy. stitches when it cuts to like um, Douglas running down the beach being chased by beastmen in tuxedos. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, they should have cast Lori Petty in the Feruza Balk part. She would have fit right in. <laughs> She'd be a good alternative, but I do like Feruza Balk in the part. No, me too. But th th the scene that Josh is talking about here, where Edward Douglas makes a big discovery, right? Because he hears some crying sounds, some very, like, disturbing noises as he's kind of slinking around the compound. Oh, I forgot about the six titties. And he sees <laughs> these monstrous humanoid animal hybrid creatures, one of which is 
giving birth to an animal hybrid creature baby, and then the others are assisting in this laboratory. And Steve, Stan Winston, his studio did the effects for this movie. Are they not fucking amazing? They are amazing, and it's amazing they got any of it done at all. Like, they only had 14 people there, and they really needed a lot more than that. And they didn't get the job till late, and they had multiple directors who didn't want the same thing. And when Frankenheimer got there, he didn't think they'd gotten enough people to play background creatures, so he suddenly wanted them to round up a bunch of extras locally wherever they could and give them makeup too. They ended up grabbing a bunch of hippies who were living on some kind of compound in the forest nearby and just making them animal people. Fucking A. I call them manimals. <laughs> manimals. I called them beastmen. Manimals is, manimals is fine. We can go with that. <laughs> manimals. The image of the uh, uh, lady beast giving birth to the baby is like one of Richard Stanley's original concept art designs for the yeah. movie. I think it's one of, probably one of the few things that carried over to the finished product, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of sad they didn't keep a lot more of his design because I think at the very least the movie would have looked really interesting. Although it's very strange to think what it would have been if he'd stayed on as director because on the one hand he talked about it as being... He wanted it to be a real version of this book that he loved, and the Brooke Lancaster version wasn't good, and blah, 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 but it sounds an awful lot like what he wanted to turn it into was, like, a freak show with Jesus undertones, so I'm not sure, but yeah, that part's really cool. I could dig that, though. I mean, I, part of me does wish that there was two movies made, and I, I want to see that Richard Stanley version, because it seems like... Like I mentioned earlier, like really artistic and out there and Burton-y and weird. And I like that shit. I, now that you mention it, like that one shot of the manimal lady giving birth, <laughs> like it seems like a it seems like a vision, like a vision from a director. Whereas in contrast, the rest of the film just feels very just stand over there, very bland, very vanilla. We're getting shit done. That, that, yeah, that's exactly it. And it's out of character even for Frankenheimer. He was never a detail-oriented director on the same level as somebody like Kubrick or, or Ridley Scott. But even still, you can definitely tell he was in get-this-shit-finished mode. And, and it shows in a lot of the rest of the film. And yeah, that, that part was uh, one of the standouts. We could have used more of that. But Edward Douglas is, of course, very, very freaked out by this experience, as I would be. I can relate to him in that way, and it's good to have a character like this that's being introduced yeah. to the land. My initial reaction was barbecue that shit. No, I'm joking. <laughs> well, you're a sick fuck. <laughs> right? <laughs> you are. The moment it started showing the manimal people, I knew right then and there, like, I couldn't take the movie serious from then on out. Like, it's, you can't. it's so dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's all pretty stupid. <laughs> it's dumb. It's flat out stupid. So Edward Douglas, he's like freaking out. He runs away and Aisa catches up with him, who's Feruza Balk. And she says, look, I'll help you get out of here, but you cannot like incriminate my father like when you leave. And he's like, fine, just get me the fuck out of here. This is too fucking much. He's freaking out. And I, I, I really like his level of uh, fear that he has. And uh, Steve, I'm going to toss to you in a second. But one of the things that I just have always found so funny is they run through the wilderness and they meet another beast man who introduces himself as Assassimon. Assassimon. Right out of like Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <laughs> Which also has great makeup effects. Yeah, I mean, if, if nothing else, for all the problems with that movie, the, the costuming, the, the monkey effect looks fantastic in that film. But Assassimon goes, <laughs> My name, Assassimon. Assassimon. And then he starts freaking out yeah, and like. Just jumping up and down and like banging his bat against the floor and I'm like does he do that every time he introduces himself I think he must he was seconds away from flinging his own shit <laughs> you from Vault he's a five finger man he's a five finger man like you see my name is Shazamon Shazamon she calls Richard or whatever his name is, uh, Five Finger Man. Edward like, Douglas. He's yeah, a Five Finger Man. Five Finger, but it's like yeah, but the other things, a, a simian. It's got five fingers too. 
Like, their hands aren't that dissimilar from ours. Their thumb's just more functional. Yeah, like, like you. He's a five-finger man. <laughs> oh, yes. It means I need to fling my own shit more. Basically, she wants to get taken to see Hellboy. That's what they're in this for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steve, yeah. she takes him through the camp, right? She takes him, yeah, through this camp. There was one kind of nice touch that Montgomery had mentioned early on when he was, was driving them in that... Uh, there had been some World War II era action on that site, and when they get to the the camp, there's the remnants of a down Japanese fighter plane, which is kind of oh. cool. Yeah, but uh, the design of the camp looks looks pretty neat. I thought it was one of the higher points of the film. But yeah, she takes him, and they want to see what the Sayer of the Law. Yeah, I'm just gonna call him Hellboy. She wants to go see Hellboy's monkey uncle. Uh, <laughs> well, he had horns, so he's a goat man. It's Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Tumnus. I love it, but fucking. Uh, I yeah. like the camp though, because the, the camp's camp cool. the camp has like all the failed beast people experiments. Yeah. You can tell that Moreau has established a hierarchy in this place, right? Yeah, the ones that are more human get to live in the house with him, and they get to basically be his slaves. It, it, see, that's kind of. Right, I kind of thought there was an undertone there, and I wonder if it was a carryover that Stanley had wanted in the film, because like. I, I don't want to get too fucked up with this, but like in the slave days, there were slaves that had to live outside and there were slaves who were allowed to work in the house. And I feel like the more advanced ones are kind of like a reference to that. They're like his house slaves, you know? The shades of that for sure. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, I mean, they get to it later on with like, if this is law, like why does the law require pain? Like he's he's got this mechanism he uses with a button he pushes that can cause pain in any of the individual animal people. And he uses that to keep them under control. So there's very much this, like, he acts like he's being altruistic. He talks about this, like, his goal is to advance the human species to a point where we're beyond petty human concerns and violence. But he uses pain as a means of control. And as we see later on, when you remove control from the situation, animals tend to inherently be violent. And so do human beings. That's one thing I'll give this film. There's yes. a moment where thematically it actually starts to overlap with Lord of the Flies. Yes. Where you can see that, like, under these circumstances, well, I, I've always been of the opinion, the idea of drawing a distinction between man and animal makes no sense. Man is an animal. We are an animal. Biologically, we are animals. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, in, under the right circumstances, when you remove the structure of society we all go that direction, you know, to eventually, to wonder. And this movie is trying to say that, yeah. obviously. Yeah, definitely. I felt like it was hammering it over my fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was going to say, never have I seen a film so bold to ask the question, who is the real animal and stuff? <laughs> nah. <laughs> uh, I love the cynic uh, version of you, Josh. It's all about, like, society and, you know, it's like... The script comes across like a like a pot smoking like teenager wrote, you know. Oh, that's not far off of Richard Stanley. I mean, <laughs> frankly, like the and I mean the dude by his own admission spends a lot of his downtime I think doing drugs. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but like while Edward Douglas and Aisa are down there in the the peasant animal camp, right? The animal human hybrids of the lower class they all live in slums they kind of like have dirty clothes they're very gross they're more grotesque than some of the others that are in the main house you got a feeling they smell like shit the father shows up steve and this is like the big introduction i think it's actually cinematically a good way to introduce the character but maybe you can tell us about the introduction of the father yeah he gets marched in on um God, there's a name for that. I can't remember what it is. It's like a triumph or something. He rolls in like a king almost. Yeah, it's like the way emperors used to get carried around in the ancient world. Where it's, it's like a raft basically just carried by people. And he gets drug in. He's, got a, he's on a throne. He's covered in white. He's got white paint on. I was going to say, I immediately started laughing the moment, the moment it showed Marlon Brando. <laughs> Right, and by the way, this one goes in that same camp with the Dolphin Man suggestion. This this is one of those wonderful creative decisions that mean John Frankenheimer didn't want to listen to. This was Brando's idea. He just put that makeup on and showed up. Nobody Steve has been paid by the Frankenheimer estate, by the yeah, way. Right? 
Yeah, I'm, you know, look, I'm sorry, but ridiculous is ridiculous. Like, at some point, I would have yelled at him, too. I don't give a shit if he's Marlon Brando. What the fuck is your problem? Like, dolphin men, white paint. I don't even know if the shit was in the script. His, the, his, first, his first introduction is like two minutes of, I don't like being in the sun. It's too hot out here. No, that's just Marlon Brando complaining. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, yes. it seems like. It's too hot out here. Like, shut up, Brando. <laughs> Deliver your fucking lines already. Calm yourself, Mr. Douglas. Don't add more pain to that already diminished life. Why have you done this? Don't you feel the heat? As I do. I, I, I can't tolerate the sun. And what it's doing to me and what it's doing to all of us, of all life on Earth. <laughs> we must return to the compound. Now, honestly, I... though, I think that's a good addition. Because it goes to show how, like, how uncomfortable this place is. There's two things <laughs> yeah. around this scene that actually work for me that you don't get through the screen. One of which is Edward Douglas covering his mouth and his nose because of how bad it fucking stinks yeah. in the peasant mutant camp. So, like, that is a good indicator. And then you can't feel the heat. You can assume it's hot, but right. Brando constantly complaining about it <laughs> kind of adds, like, that discomfort. Like, this is a very unpleasant environment I mean, to have to be in. did anyone ask him if he's sure it's not just because he weighed 400 pounds by mm -hmm. the time they cast him in this film? Like, that might be part of it. <laughs> That's a factor, yeah. <laughs> what is this accent? The accent! Release him. <laughs> Release him. Give him the gun. What? Give him the gun. He's very frightened. Give it to him. I'm sorry, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I appreciate Brando really was a great actor, and he had some amazing parts in some fantastic films, but it's like, people talk about this legend of Brando, and the last 15 years of his career was all this. He was also <laughs> in a movie really late. It may have even been the last thing he was in, just a few years later with Edward Norton and Robert De Niro. I can't remember what it was. I think The Heist, something like that, was about a group of guys trying to plan a theft from a, a, a government building in Canada. It's not a terrible movie, but like... Brando did the same bit there. He wouldn't lose. He wouldn't learn his lines. He had them all read to him uh, through an earpiece. He insisted a tiny two foot man do everything that he does. He didn't want to wear normal clothing. I've heard so he spends the entire movie in a robe because that was more comfortable for him. He's like, I, I'm going to wear a robe, and everyone's like, Why? Because I, I don't want to wear clothes. Fuck you. Where's my lines? Because I'm going to give me my headset. You know, so it's like, dude, this dude, this dude, at some point, it's like, I don't care how famous you are, just fucking go somewhere else. But, just go somewhere else. But does it kind of work, though, for the movie, him wearing the robe and it, him wearing all white and looking like alien? Like it, he's, it does. He sees himself as a god. Yeah, no, it, and that's that's the problem. Is there? Were, it's, it's like, it's like you grab a handful of ideas. You got a hundred ideas. Two of them are good, 98 are bad. You throw them at the wall, and occasionally you get to those two. Right. You spaghetti the situation. Right. Exactly. And part of the process, is like during the writing, is supposed to be you throw all those bad ideas out there and then you try to get rid of as many of them as you can. So you've refined it down to the, the good part because you're going to have them. But with Brando, it's just like I'm giving you whatever comes to my head and some of it's going to be good. And it's like, all right. <laughs> and occasionally we'll revisit the dolphin idea. <laughs> right, yeah, you know, I might try to take up more of your time with the dolphin man. I want him to be a dolphin in the end. You just really gotta hear me out on it. He tells Frankenheimer, I want you to shut the production down so we can rewrite the script, and his big idea for the ending is Miro's a dolphin. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> how Tommy Wiseau is that? <laughs> yes! Dude. Oh my god, this is the most Tommy Wiseau thing ever. Like, And maybe Johnny Vampire. There's a thin line between... A creative genius and a total fucking retard. Right, that's the thing. At some point, I'd be like, you know what, Marlon? There's a fresh pizza in your trailer. Mmm, <laughs> pizza. <laughs> right? <laughs> this one's got pineapple on it. <laughs> You're bribing him with food? It's pizza, right? It's, it's just like you are you are a, a, a brilliant, genius, crazy, insane child with an eating disorder. I'm surprised they didn't <laughs> have like a little helmet with like... A stick and a string attached to some food just outside of Marlin's reach. <laughs> and it just kept him going. 
Ah, uh, like in every director, every director. I mean, and they'd had move problems with the Mondays previous movie for New Line. Like it's not it, it, it like it wasn't just one person. It wasn't just like Frankenheimer was being so shitty he chose to act this way. It's like that that comment's not even a defense of Frankenheimer. I'm just talking in general. Like he was like this with everybody. I love the idea that it's like, all right, Marlon, I, I, I went to bat for you on this one. The studio really didn't want you. They said you caused a lot of problems, but don't worry. I got your back. You're on set. And immediately he causes like more problems than ever before. Yeah, exactly. It just gets worse. He's like, could you please worse. at least behave yourself? You know, I, I can imagine someone sitting down with them beforehand going, could you please just at least be nice? And it, it just stares at them and goes, like, no. And he no. whips out his cock and starts jerking it. <laughs> <laughs> My dogs are going to eat you. <laughs> oh, fuck. And in the last act, I want to fight a giant spider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Superman can't fly. <laughs> I don't want to see that cape. <laughs> no cape. And, uh, yeah. Steve, we do get to see the implants and the use of them, like you talked about earlier. Moreau, just to show Edward Douglas that he can do it, he basically shocks all the mutant creatures into submission just to show that he can, right? Just yeah. to show that, like, this is the power I wield over them. And that's, it's pretty fucked up. That's one other... I, I think that that got lost and it's one of the good things that they could have emphasized more like Moreau and to your points you were saying this a minute ago Muro basically thinks he's God not not quite but pretty damn close and the problem is he's got this godlike ability to manipulate genetics but he doesn't have godlike power in any other manner and he needs to give it to himself artificially and he needs a mechanism for actual control so this is how he does it he embeds these little shock devices into everyone, and he can just make the entire crowd submit all at once with the push of a button. I was on board with that to an extent, like the kind of a, a monstrous, like rolling over his like just fucked up experiments until going a little further into the movie when when he gets killed. Like it, the movie suddenly makes me like is trying to make me feel sorry for him and like sad and it's very inconsistent that way i i did not feel those emotions because this is a fucked up thing yeah it's kind of you're right it's it's like on the one hand this dude's this mad scientist playing god doing fucked up things he shouldn't be doing with human lives and on the other hand it's like oh but he had this peaceful vision of the world. He was a messiah. Like four or five of them really liked the situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's like three good ones among these dozens of tortured souls that he fucked with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course his homies like liked it. They were like living in the mansion. They got tuxedos. Right? <laughs> and there's the the one gentle one, his son, who ends up just getting fucking left there in the end and I'm sure got eaten three days later. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I want to talk about those guys because he does take Edward Douglas back to the compound. By the way, continuing what I said earlier, Edward Douglas is thoroughly fucking freaked out. He says a line that I've always loved. This is the most outrageous spectacle I have ever witnessed. Which applies both in movie and during production, I'm sure, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> but when he takes him back to the compound... Moreau introduces him to his children, which that's how he refers to them as. There's Wagdi, Azazello, and Maling. Mr. Douglas, first of all, for the sake of propriety, I'd like to present my children. Hello, I am Wagdi. How do you do, sir? I'm Azazello. My name is Maling. You've already met my beautiful daughter, Aisa. Magi, would you present yourself, please? And then, of course, there's the little guy, Magi. Now, the, the little guy <laughs> has a really great comedic moment, which I'm pretty sure was just, like, done completely by the editor, right? Because Edward Douglas goes, Look at these people! Look at him! Right? And then, and then right as he says that, Magi, like, turns to the camera. <laughs> right? Oh, my God. It's yeah. beautiful. This scene just opens with a flat shot of Marlon Brando being scrubbed, scrubbed clean by this like little mini guy. And <laughs> I, I, I was dying laughing. 
there's no way that you can give me that kind of scene and, and me not take it like comedically. Well, Josh, you didn't see the uh, full shower scene they cut. The royal penis yeah, is clean. Brando goes goes full nude. The, that little thing's got to bathe him with a ladder. Yeah. And oh. they got a jo- rag on a six-foot stick. It's coming to America. That guy cleans him. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Brando gets a scrubbing. What, what, is that a scene that Marlon just insisted be in the movie? I'm sure I, I was. I, I'm a hundred percent certain that moment did arise out of Brando's insistence that they give that character more screen time. I want him to clean my cock. <laughs> right? How many how many tacos can this little thing carry? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because that little dude dresses exactly like. Yeah, Brando. they've got him in the same outfits. Dude, and yes, that is I funny. It is really funny. Uh, it's the funniest goddamn thing to me is when they're fucking playing piano together and they're wearing matching outfits. <laughs> they even spoof it with Mephisto in, in South Park where he's, the little guy's wearing, Kevin's wearing the same outfit, yeah. the shirt and the hat. It's so good. And it's funny because he even has a little do-rag. <laughs> I mean, yes, I love the yes. do-rag. Oh, my God. Maling is one of the children and he's like, he seems pretty together. Like, he seems like he was one step before Aisa. He's the guy yeah. that he reads uh, Yates before they have dinner. Right. And he's like super proud of himself after he does it. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to a nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast? It's our come round at last. Slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Oh, Maling, that was just a beautiful. Thank you so much. I I don't know, man. Something about Maling, I've always liked him. I remember watching this movie as a kid. I got this from a, a local video store, and I just saw it on the shelf, and I was like, oh, this is for me. He's kind of like the most tragic character of them all in a way. Because, you know, he doesn't even seem able to fight on his own behalf. Yeah. yeah, he seems to almost have, like, no violent tendencies. No, he just wants to exist. You know, I think he's really the closest... To what Moreau wanted in a way. He's got no, I don't mean it as an insult to the character, but he's got no real fight in him. He just seems to be content with the idea of a peaceful existence. And based on what Moreau was talking about, that seems to be exactly what he'd, what he'd wanted. That dude was going to have like a lot more screen time until that little guy came into the picture. The little guy, the little guy who spent his entire time there hitting on every female cast member he could get near. Like, yeah. It's a little fuck. Stole my screen time. And uh, apparently Val Kilmer treated this dude that plays Maling like shit. Yeah, I mean, apparently Kilmer was treating everybody like shit. But he told this guy, because this guy was reading lines, and Kilmer was like, yeah, that's pretty good. And the guy was like, oh, thank you. You know, this is Val Kilmer complimenting him. Right. And Kilmer goes, but just know, if it comes down to you or me, it's going to be me you. every time. Yeah, yeah it's going to be all right. Yeah, absolutely. What does that mean, Val? I think Kilmer w- really he was, was threatened by him. Yeah, when well, it doesn't excuse the behavior in the least. I'm not trying to excuse the behavior, but I think the divorce was really fucking with his head, and he had just come off a gigantic publicity tour for Batman, which is exhausting, and making Batman, I know, was bad for him. Yes. And presumably Jean Claude Van Damme amounts of cocaine, right? You <laughs> were right. No, I don't think he was using. I don't think he was that like much. that, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, know. and. and but Batman, I think, was a very isolating experience for him. He, he's commented before that it got to the point where nobody on set was talking to him, and it wasn't because of his behavior. It was because they, being in the suit made it too hard to communicate, and he wasn't getting any feedback. Like It's funny, you know, he also complained about not getting enough direction from Michael Schumacher, and, or Joel Schumacher, excuse me. And, um, you know, and I, so, you know, I think Batman had been a hard movie for him to make. He came off it feeling very isolated. He came off it feeling totally unhappy with the product that he'd made. Then he finds out, whatever the exact timeline was, he finds out he's getting divorced. He gets served the divorce papers in the worst possible way. He's exhausted from the PR tour. Like, it doesn't excuse any of his behavior, but I, I don't think he was in a good place. I really don't. I just think that, like, a, a big actor like him to, like, push down an unknown... Oh, yeah. Is Super like, shitty. It's, like, the worst way you could behave. Yeah, and, like, why do you need to be so insecure? With the exception of Brando, everyone on this set is below you. So what are you worried about? Yeah. You, you should know? be lifting people up, though, man. Right. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I'm getting a mild amusement thinking about, like, Val Kilmer getting, like, 
insecure about <laughs> the actor. He's like, oh my, oh my god, I think he might be better than me. <laughs> it's yeah. so part and parcel. It's such the, the stereotypical trope for an actor. You know, that insecurity it really is there for a lot of them. And, you know, they, they need to be getting told how good they are. It's unfortunate. Moreau takes him to dinner, Steve, and this is where we get maybe some of the, like, theological discussion about, like, what he's doing and is it right or wrong. Uh, it's pretty on the nose, but it's something I did like as a kid. Yeah, I mean, I guess at least they give the uh, Moreau character some time to discuss his motivation. Justify his Justify, actions. yeah, try to give it something. <laughs> he says that his work, like, we, we learn his goal. He's trying to genetically create a divine creature that is incapable of malice. Well, Mr. Douglas, very good of you to join us. Oh, please tell me, is the, is the devil still pursuing you? <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps you could explain to me what you mean by the devil. You seem to be on terms with him. Well, permit me, Mr. Douglas, to tell you something of the devil as I've come to know him. The devil is that element in human nature that impels us to destroy and debase. And what are you about upon this island but destruction and debasement? Oh, well, I can tell you very plainly. For 17 years, I have been striving to create a, some measure of refinement in the human species, you see. And it is here on this very island that I, sir, have found the very essence of the devil. What do you mean? I have seen the devil in my microscope, and I have chained him. And I suppose you could say, in a sense, metaphorically speaking, I've cut him to pieces. The devil, Mr. Douglas, I have found, is nothing more than a a tiresome collection of genes. And it is with great assurance that I can tell you that Lucifer, son of morning, is no more. I mean, I guess by malice, he must mean like formulated malice. Cause like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, like dogs are domesticated dogs are like the sweetest animals in the world. They want to be near people that they, they like being comfortable, but you know, even they'll get get shitty with you know because they're animals. We're all animals, you know. Hell, even a normal human being, I guess that's what he wants to get rid of. What would just snap sometimes? So, you know, I don't know what you're aiming for. I'm not aware of the existence of an animal that is beyond that capacity. He just tries them all. He's yeah, like, exactly. Even blatantly like violent ones. He's like, <laughs> right? Yeah, some of them are hyenas and shit. It's a hyena like, is the worst idea you could go for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hyena's whole existence is literally a violent fight for survival. It's yes. not. Even, it's not even a matter of just needing food. It's like you live in an environment where some of the other animals you live with are trying to also kill you. Like, yeah. Just as a side note, I was wondering this whole movie, is he fucking these things? So what's really funny about that is in Richard Stanley's mind, 100% yes. Stanley, his, and it goes back to his original sketches before he even sold the film, envisioned there being a lot of sex on this island, a lot of sex on this island, including between the animal people and regular people. And it probably would have involved Moreau Montgomery, especially was supposed to be basically humping whatever would have sex with them. Oh man. So, Hopefully there's no duck man. <laughs> I love that show. I love duck man. Is that bestiality? Does that still count? I mean, if it's part human, I don't know. I don't know. He's in international waters. There's no, <laughs> there's no rules. <laughs> what about uh what's her name? Aisa? Uh, yeah, she's she's, she's she mostly looking human. I'm gonna tell you something, she's close enough to human. If I'd been on that island and I'd gotten a chance, I wouldn't have thought about it. I would have went beast mode. I wouldn't oh yeah, beast mode. There you go. I wouldn't have done anything with the others. Too animal. But if but if she'd been down, I, you know what? Alright. Does that make you a furry? Probably. <laughs> I which is effectively means that after this I'm gonna have to go like like kill myself. What about them <laughs> six titties? Does that do anything for you? I'm really more into the three titty chick from Total Recall. Yeah, three's enough. Three's, three's enough. enough. Six is the crowd. 
So after the dinner, Josh, later that night, Edward Douglas is like, had enough of this shit. Like, he cannot fucking take it anymore. And he tries to escape. Why don't you tell me about how that goes? I think it's funny. They're like, yeah, we'll, we'll entertain you a little bit more. We'll have a trial in the morning. And cut to like 3 a.m. where he's like, no, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> fuck your trial. <laughs> fuck your trial, you fucking weird pasty person. Fat pasty piece of shit. <laughs> you pasty piece of shit. So he tries to to leave by going to the boat. Did they establish this boat? Because I thought... Not really, but they, they happen to just have a small boat Okay, there. all right. So the movie didn't tell us there was a boat, but all of a sudden there's a boat. And he starts hearing like little pitter patters, and I get I got the faint scent of really bad '90 CGI, and my um, senses paid off because we are treated with some of the worst looking, like Microsoft Windows '95 rat creatures. <laughs> yeah, let's stand on. They're bipedal like rat mini men. <laughs> Beetle rats. There are so many of those, and it's going to keep happening because it's the nature of CG, but there are so many of those where even when the movie itself was kind of mediocre, I remember seeing it in the theater at the time, like in 96, and going, whoa, that, at least those look cool, the CGs, because it was new, you know, and you'd never yeah. seen anything, and it looked neat in the moment, but it, you fast forward a handful of years, and it's like, oh, no, that shit doesn't hold up. It doesn't that, look real. No, it doesn't look real, and that's most of them. You get this tiny, tiny, like T2, The Abyss, and the first Jurassic Park. That the CG is good enough that it even now it hasn't become bothersome. Like Reptile in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> right? Yes. yes. Or uh, even the stuff Lucas did. Here's my Star Wars. You know I'm going to get it in somewhere. Like the stuff that Lucas did with the special editions in 97. I don't even necessarily dislike all the individual changes themselves in terms of intent. It's just some of the CG. And this guy owns ILM. Some of that CG did not age well. No. <laughs> But those rats are bad. That whole scene is bad of Douglas trying to escape. It is. And by that, I mean it doesn't need to be there. It serves no purpose other than showing that he wants to get off, which we're already very aware of. Yeah. He goes to this fucking boat, and we see these rats, and it's like, one, why do they have them? Was that part of his experiments yes. to, like, make these rats? Why is one in a cage? Yeah, why is one in a cage? And then the other ones surround him like they're going to jump him. It's weird. Yeah, it's almost like Velociraptor status. Honestly, like they're I, encircling him. I couldn't have said it better myself. This, why does this scene exist? Why does this movie exist is a really, a more valid question, but why does this scene specifically exist is a, is a very valid criticism. When it creates a really conflicting line of thinking for me, because the scene itself I don't like and don't want it to be there, but like... I feel like if this had been better scripted and better planned, that one of the problems with it is that an hour and 35 minutes isn't long enough for these characters. Miro by himself really demands more than that in order to have a proper arc. And one of my big complaints about this film is they go from introducing him to killing him like way too quickly in terms of there being any chance to develop that character. So on the one hand, I'm like, if the scripting had been better and the characters had been better written for and better invested in, this could have been a two or two and a half hour movie and they would have had enough chance to develop these people. And instead it's an hour and 35 minutes. And even with this short running time, they're sticking in these scenes that don't need to be there. You could have trimmed this and made it an hour and 29 minute movie, Yeah, you know? And it, it, it's, so it's like, what? fuck you, do something right. Maybe it was like another Brando compromise. Like he wanted a scene where he played multiple rats in like a really right. bad green screen, like Godzilla <laughs> style. And they're like, no, we'll just, we'll do the scene, but with CGI. See, I bet, maybe it was, you know, it was like the bucket where it's like, fine, Marlon, you want a bucket? Here's a fucking bucket. Will you read your lines? Will you please read your goddamn lines? No, but I'll have someone deliver them through my earpiece. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know my lines. You know, I don't know my lines. I haven't read a script in 42 years. I, uh, I keep thinking of uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Tropic Thunder saying, like, I don't read the script. The script reads me. <laughs> what does that mean? Yes. <laughs> it's like, I, I have also, 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 director, sir, I have six hours worth of notes about a script I haven't read. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'll hear you out. Yeah, let me sit here. Dolphin Men, you said, and you didn't read the original script. 
you didn't read it and you don't, you're not familiar with H.G. Wells' book either. Well, if I refuse to listen to all this, will you please make a public statement about what an awful director I was? Good. All right. Thank I, I, you. S Steve, have you read this original material, H.G. Wells? I have, although in fairness, the only time I've read it all the way through, I was about 14. I remember enjoying it, but it, I don't remember all the details. Just on a surface level, like, I don't know much about H.G. Wells' writing, but this just sounds like a bad day at all. Like, I love Stephen King, but Stephen King also wrote The Tommyknockers. Oh. And this, sell. this one, the book itself is way more entertaining. They changed enough about this that it doesn't really like. I love Blade Runner, but there's a, it's got a credit for being based on a Philip K. Dick story. And the truth is, there's so little left of the Philip K. Dick story in it. They may as well have just not included the credit, and I don't think anyone would have noticed. Like The Running Man. Yeah, exactly. Like The Running Man, where like technically, yeah, they started off with Richard Bachman's story, but there's they share virtually nothing in common. I, and I would say. That's pretty much the same here. Like, it, 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 if you took a muffin with sprinkles on it and took just the sprinkles off, that's what made it from the book into this movie. You know what I mean? The Trial of Lomai, Steve. Yeah. Lomai is the cheetah man, by the way. Yes. Who looks really fucking awesome. He does. He looks good. When he is a person and not a CGI effect. Right, Josh? Oh, my God. He... The, the effect of him... There's like, it's like four or five frames per second. And he just like skips across this lake like he's super yes. fucking Mario. Like, doop, On doop, the four doop. legs? Oh my God, it's so bad. It looks awful. It looks like they caught him doing four poses in stop motion and then blended them together to make it look like he could run on four legs. It's like, look, they're either jointed like people or they're jointed like cats. There's a reason cats don't walk on their hind legs and there's a reason that people don't walk on all fours. Like... Moving back and forth between the two from a physiological perspective makes no sense. It either walks on all fours or it walks on its back legs. Like, even animals that can stand up rarely ever do. Like, bears can do it, but they only do it in little bits. You don't see them mostly walking around on their hind legs. It, right. Yeah, they're not built for it. Like, Lomai is played by Mark Dacascus. Did you know that? Oh, you know what? I'd completely forgotten that, and I hadn't noticed in the credits. Holy shit. Okay, Dacascus is... Who, who's played by Mark Dacascus? Lomai, the Cheetah Man. The That's Cheetah Mark Man? Mark Dacascus? Wow. He's Jimmy from Double Dragon. He is. Yeah, Jimmy, or Bimmy. He's been in some super garbage, but he's also been in some really cool stuff. In fact, oh, Josh, here's one. Here's one. I, I'm actually... I'm going to throw fits about this till we do it. The three of us should do a movie that he's in called The Brotherhood of the Wolf. It's oh, a really dude, neat... I haven't seen that movie in so long. See, yeah, that's a really neat one no one even really remembers. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. DeCast has been some real garbage, but he's also had some very fun roles. I like that dude. <laughs> he also narrated a really cool documentary about Musashi Miyamoto. Oh, anyway. really? Yeah. <laughs> Steve, how does the trial go? Not well. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, Lomai, Lomai has killed a rabbit, and Moreau knows this because... Aisa, whatever her name is, Aisa, saw the rabbit, saw Lomai, knows that he did it. So they put Lomai on this kind of mock trial because you're not allowed to kill anything. Not to kill for pleasure. Nope. Not to kill for hatred. Not to kill anything, anytime. That law... That law has been broken. None escape. None escape. None shall escape. Who is he? <laughs> who has done this? Evil is he who breaks the law. Do you hear, Larbar? He's created a bunch of hybrids between human beings and predatory animals and then told them that they're not allowed to follow any predatory in animal's <laughs> primary instinct. They can't eat meat. Can't eat meat. Can't hunt. Can't eat meat. Like even 
domesticated dogs will occasionally try to hunt stuff. Cats, which can't really be domesticated at all, do it constantly. Anyone who's ever, not every cat, but if you've owned cats, it's a solid chance you've had one that's brought home rats or brought home birds or at least has tried to get them. I had a Labrador that drowned a rat in our swimming pool and then brought it in as a gift to my mother. Like, it's just what they do. Did he wrap it? He, you know, he almost did. He had it yeah. hand in his mouth. He was so happy. with was my, my fucking 5.45 in the morning. I'm asleep before I get up for high school. All of a sudden, my mother starts going off in the kitchen. She decided to go down there early to feed the dog. She lets them out there early. The male comes back in. We have two dogs. Male comes back in with the rat in its mouth. I, we're running downstairs. What's wrong? What's wrong? I can't remember what my mother was screaming about. Like, Your dog's got a rat. Like, fuck. All right. <laughs> I guess I get to deal with this at 6 a.m. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, that's just, why would you do that? But anyway, so they've got him on this trial. And uh, for some reason, here's a moment that makes no goddamn sense at all. He's got his son, muro has got his son, the well-mannered one, in the, in the or who you think is the well-mannered one, who actually turns out to be a psycho. Azazello? Yeah, Azazello. He, Azazello's acting as like the the court guard, the warden. What do you call those guys? Bailiff. Uh, bailiff. Yeah, he's acting like he's the bailiff. For the the trial, well, he just decides all of a sudden to put a cap in in this other dude's he head. Blows his fucking brains out. He just walks up and puts him in. It's like, dude, this whole trial is about how none of you, under any circumstances, is allowed to kill anyone, and you just put a bullet in his brain. What did you even need the gun for? I forgive you, my friend. Father. Lomai has broken the law. He killed a living thing. Oh my God. What have you done? I'm sorry, Father. I thought you wanted me to protect the law. And so, and then... When the animals start freaking out, Miro responds by by hitting them all with his pain buzzer. Yeah, uh, that's how he handles his problems. Right, so now... But now, it, the fucked up thing is that Miro, this trial was just like a mock trial, really. Yeah. Because he forgave Mo, uh, Lo Mai. Even though Lo Mai, the cheetah man, went to attack Miro yeah. just for the accusation of killing a rabbit, which he did do. He charges at Moreau. Moreau shocks him. Yeah. And then Moreau puts his hand on his head and says, I forgive you, my son, in right. a very Jesus Christ-like yes, way. Yes, while he's wearing white robes. Right. You know. But then here comes Azazello and just shoots him anyway. Yeah, he's just like, I'm going to kill you. There's a moment where Moreau asks where Tamara Morrison got uh, the fucking gun. <laughs> And, like, Val gives <laughs> Moreau a look and then gives Edward Douglas a look and I'm confused. Val shrugs and it's never really answered. What the fuck? It's funny yeah. because, like, Azazella looks at Montgomery. Montgomery looks at Douglas. Douglas looks at Montgomery. Montgomery looks back at Azazello. Azazello looks back at Moreau. It's like this weird domino effect of, I like, looking at people. Azazello looks over at Lando in disguise. This is the one moment in the film that I really will just blame Frankenheimer for. That one scene. He he should have noticed that there was no motivation to what they were doing. I have a feeling by the time they got there, it was just like, just film it. Just film it. We need to be done. You know what I mean? And then they all give blank expressions. Okay, next scene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. It's all shrug. I don't he knew because several other directors had said, "There's no way I'm getting myself involved with that shit show." And he'd heard he he managed to get a three picture deal out of the studio for taking this job. So I think I think part of it was just just I want to get done with this so I can move on to something that I actually want to make. But yeah. Now this is where hyena kind of becomes the main antagonist of the movie, and he continues to be throughout because you kind of get the impression that hyena man was friends with cheetah man. Yeah, right? like they were buddies. They were homies. The, the other thing that doesn't make sense is like the animal people of different species are friends, even though the animals they represent would not get along in nature. Like, yeah. I'm just still like, I find it super amusing that they were like, you half leopard man, why did you kill? Why did you hunt? Yeah, why did you do what leopards do? How were they eating? Are they like, you expect a half leopard man to eat a salad? 
Yeah, they take a lot of ranch, though. Yeah, well, you, yeah, it's a ton of thousands. They're going through a bunch of Hidden Valley. The amount of Hidden Valley dressing getting delivered to this island. Not Italian. It does not agree with me. Right? I, there's just some dudes, like, I've never seen so much blue cheese go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but these are the ones that live in the encampment out by themselves. Lomai doesn't live in the main village. So, like, what are they eating, then? Are they getting food delivered to Kibble. them? Kibble. Kibble? Yeah, they're not allowed to hunt. Like... You know, you, you you don't like, like, you can stop your dogs from hunting, but you're feeding them. So, like, you got to give them something else, yeah. right? How do you feed 100 people on this island? You know how much kittle kaboom I'm going through? Yeah. They're not growing any fruit. There's another one, dude. It's another part. Like, they could have had this movie be two hours long if it were well written and given it more back. They could have had an orchard or something there. And Moro's making an attempt to give them something else. But No. Hyena examines the body of Lomai and finds, like, a massive computer chip on his rib. Like, this thing is fucking big, right? Yeah. Yeah, a little... He figures... He finds the little shocker device, really. And he realizes... He puts it together. He's got enough smarts to realize that this is the thing that causes the pain. I think they know that the pain stems from their, your chest. Yeah. And that's, like, kind of how he puts it together. And he removes his own implant, doesn't he, Josh? He does. They're getting smarter. <laughs> he rips his implant out, and then you f- we get a scene where where Val is just passing out drugs to all the yeah. all the animals. I don't know if you guys noticed, but at one point he gives the little tiny guy a little shot, and he just starts wigging the fuck out. <laughs> I was very fascinated. My eyes were drawn to whatever that little tiny guy was doing whenever he was high on drugs. What is it you're giving them exactly? It's a combination of endorphins and hormones. Keeps them from retrogressing. Retrogressing into what? Well, it isn't pretty. Well, it certainly seems to improve their mood. Oh, that's my contribution. That little methamphetamine, some morphine, some shrooms, and some other shit. Keeps them mellow, keeps them, well, keeps them coming back to more. Yeah, I mean, he does say that there's like meth and shrooms and a couple other things in this concoction, which is also like their their supplement, right? Yeah, he's been giving, at Moreau's instruction, Montgomery is supposed to be giving all of the animal people a monthly shot that stops the animal part of their genetics from completely taking over. I, I, I get, I guess the, the idea, it's kind of like a fly situation with Jeff Goldblum, where like if they're not getting the drug, the longer they live, the more the other thing becomes the dominant thing. Yeah. But that, it's strange, doesn't really make sense. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So they're all getting this drug and he tells Richard or Douglas, whatever, at one point <laughs> that... uh that yeah, I I put I put coke and uh, LSD and some other things, little small quantities in this concoction, so that they stay in a good mood, which just further, and they keep coming back for more. Yeah, but which just further underlines the point that like Miro's whole idea is obviously an abject failure because these these people, for lack of a better term, are all constantly really way more prone to giving in to their animal side than like they've got to be given a drug that stops them from physically changing into a full blown animal. They've got to have pain devices and mock trials to stop them from hunting. It's like, dude, all you've done here is create animals with some human esque features. Like, I hope that's what your goal was. Cause that's all you ended up with. <laughs> yeah. Like it lets you know the, by the end of the movie, the, Every manimal on that island was going to be dead within a month. That Well, that's the other thing. I mean, I don't want to blow the end, but it's just like, well, then what happens to all of them from here? Because it kind of seems like what's left of the nice ones are going to get murdered by all the others. It seems like it's just, just going to be Lord of the Flies. And then they never tell you whether these things are capable of reproduction. So it's like now you've left a bunch of these animal people on the island i think the mean ones are going to murder the nice (laughs) ones and then just just fuck like they're just going to keep having babies probably eat all of their food supply like what is there to hunt on that island you probably not much yeah it's probably best if they just die off it's it's nature's little accident you could be right assuming that the depending on whether or not the landscape can support them the long term for what's left of them may just be dying of starvation Especially if you <laughs> refuse to eat fish. 
Oh, um, yeah. I mean, that's your biggest resource, you fucking idiots. None of them are fish people, so they've got limited ability to swim, and they've burned all their boats. So I don't know how you're going to fish. Ron Perlman's just like, we've got to learn how to plant tomatoes. Sooner or later, we all want a thing that is bad. So, walk on all fours. To eat flesh or fish. To make laws to more than one. Every which way. These are all bad things. These are not the things that men do. <laughs> right? To plant tomatoes. That is the law. That is right. the law. To eat the onion. <laughs> to watch Dr. Moreau method acting. That is the law. <laughs> In the law. I mean, that's another thing, man. Like, I, I obviously Brando was phoning it all in on purpose. But for all the talk over all the years about how Brando is supposed to be one of the greatest actors who ever lived, you look at the last few movies he was in, like this, and even Don Juan DeMarco, and the, the one he was in with Ed, Ed Norton and, and De Niro, or all of them. He's got people feeding his lines in the headset. It's like, this dude is phoning this shit in. Godfather's a banger, though. The Godfather's a banger. Like, the dude had had his time, you know? Yeah. The, the Godfather's a banger. I mean, and, and but by the time you get anything much past about the early 90s, if Brando's in it, he's just like, I'm just here to be here. The best part about Godfather is when the tiny two-foot version of Godfather is also <laughs> we're talking about. Yeah, that was Al Pacino. His son Fredo's <laughs> upset because he's giving the family business to the, the little one. <laughs> the little one. <laughs> I've got to watch this movie. I'm giving this to your little brother. And by little brother, I mean your older brother who's tiny. <laughs> he's two foot, but he's older. My name is Luca Brasi, sir. <laughs> uh. At this point, Hyena Man shows Val that... He's taken the implant out. I don't. I don't know why he decided to show it to him. It seemed like you could have had the, the upper hand with the surprise, but yeah, it just gives his hand away. Like, all right, I ripped this out, and Val's immediate reaction is, all right, this some bitch has got to go down. Aina, come. Pain. No more. What's going on? Christ, he pulled it out. What? His implant, he pulled out his implant. They all have implants. It's how we shock them into submission. We have to find him. We have to dart him and get him back to the compound. Hunt, Master. Hunt. Yeah, yeah, hunt. Tell Alex a good hunt. The only thing I can think of is it's almost something, it's almost like something a little kid would do when they didn't know that they weren't supposed to do it. Like, look, Dad, I pulled this thing out, you know? <laughs> Except he knew he wasn't supposed to. Look, Dad, I pulled the implant out of my chest <laughs> with my claw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was about to say, I pulled the shock implant out of my collarbone. <laughs> He's like, why are you showing me this? You, you know you weren't supposed to do that. You son of a bitch. <laughs> you need stitches. Right, you need stitches. Great. Now you and dad get to go to the hospital. <laughs> Let's go to the hospital. No, hospital, schmospital. I got to put my son down. He took the fucking shock collar. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's probably the most sensible thing, though. I mean, you don't... that that Once that thing goes running wild, it's going to literally just start killing people, and they do. Yeah, Hyena kind of gathers a group of other disgruntled like-minded animals peasant animal mutant hybrids and they like they 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 kind of want to escape the tyranny of Moreau it seems like right yeah i think they want to get rid of the dictator yeah they want they want to start a revolution wake up the revolution has begun generation x is in effect so Moreau at this point's been on screen for all of like 20 minutes and they murder him yeah, he does get murdered. Yeah. They play his piano first, very shittily. They managed to get three or four whole scenes out of uh, Brando during the 45 minutes he was willing to work. 
And uh, <laughs> you know. we can't gloss over this bucket scene. So what's the story with this bucket? Well, uh, that's the story with the. I just kind of touched on it before. Like that was not part of the script. Brando at one point said that he thought it would be a nice touch, that he thought it would look good because it was his funny way of keeping cool. But then he also had the dolphin idea and he wanted it. And he wanted, they had nothing there to use and he apparently picked it out and the prop people just cut a hole in it and put it on his head. And he, he made up the part where Ais is dumping the ice in it for him. And in his head, he's thinking the ice is how the dolphin is hydrating itself. But, I mean, that's just goes to show you how off the rails this whole thing was. Is by the time they got to here, Brando's like, I want that bucket on my head, and I want her to dump ice into it. And they were like, fucking fine. We read your lines. Just here's the, here's the goddamn bucket, Marlon. <laughs> so just do it! Like, fuck me. <laughs> oh, my God. So this is just literally like a remnant of... Yes, uh, this is the vestigial temper tantrum, Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, again, I think everyone ultimately was a little bit in fault, at fault, all including Frankenheimer. He could have, could have been a little, especially because this is the third movie he had taken over. He had a reputation for doing this. That's why they wanted him. He had, he, this is the third film he'd taken over from a director who wasn't working. It, it had, he had done well with it two times before. He'd won a bunch of awards. He was well, and so, you know, he, he could have been better too. No denial, but like all of them. Every time I see this scene, I'm going to just think, Brando thinks he has a blowhole right now. And, right, yeah, and that's part of why I'm prone to defend Frankenheimer more than the other two. It's not that he's totally innocent, but it's like at some point I would have started screaming at these guys too. Like, Oh my God, I, dude, it's a meme. Right. You know that meme where the guy's standing in the background and says they don't know and everyone's having a party? <laughs> right. They don't know I have a blowhole right now. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, and it's like, you know, fucking, on the days Marlon even bothers to show up, he won't come out of his trailer and he doesn't know his lines and he wants a bucket on his head and he thinks he's got a blowhole and now Val is throwing a temper tantrum and, and fucking Feruza ran away. It's just like, the fuck is going on here? Will somebody just do their job? Like, fuck, man. No, absolutely not. And of course, when it comes down to it, every single one of them thinks it's the other one's fault. And it's like, it's all your fault. Just shut up and do your job. So Hyena in the main house with Moreau, before he kills him, I think there's uh, some level of Hyena trying to understand his existence here, right? I think he does plan to kill Moreau and kind of like try to take power because he's tired of being like under the fucking fist of this dude. But he wants to know like, why am I here? Right? He asks him, like, why did you make us? And Moreau basically doesn't give him any satisfactory answers and gets his ass eaten. Father, I must ask a question. Please. What am I? A good father. Yet we are not like you. What are we? You are you, you are my children. You are all my children. Tell me why you make the pain. If we are your children. Ah. Uh, you see, you are my children, but law is necessary. If there is no more pain. Is there no more law? Hmm? <laughs> there is always law. It's Blade Runner. They just stole the whole poorly moment from Blade Runner where Batty finally gets to meet his creator. He's finally talking to Tyrell. And he just wants to know, like, why? What is it now? How rare is it? It's the greatest exchange in that movie, you know? How, how rare it is to get to meet your maker and finally have this moment to like meet the thing that made you and ask it why you exist and it's it you realize in that moment that the answers aren't satisfying you oh, know you mean in blade runner not this movie. in blade runner yeah oh, you know, in uh, this movie you get the poor man's like fucked up version of it and it's like yeah it's one of the few times this movie brings up a theme yeah. of some sort it's almost exciting before you get to the way it pans out. It's like, oh my god, they're actually going to touch on something here, even if it's a knockoff of what they did in another film. I do like Hyena's 
Judge Dredd impression, though. <laughs> I am the law. I am the law. Dude, I hate that part. I hate that, like, I, I have a real problem. I mean this sincerely. Like, I do not like other people's faces being too close to me. It really bothers me. It's not even about the other person. It's not even like, I don't like you. I just, for some reason, it's like a weird physical trigger for me. Like, I don't, unless it's a woman, like a woman that I'm with. Like, I don't like other people's faces being too close to my face. I don't know. It's weird. Anyway, that, that whole scene, he's so, like, in Thulis's face. And he's right there. And he's got the animal breath. And, like, just, you know, tell them I'm the law. Mm. Uh, tell, tell them, them. I'm... I am the law. I am, I am God. I'm just like, no, Tell just it. eat me. Like, I, I don't God. want you to be in my face anymore. Please just kill me. Hmm? Like. Pain no more. Good God. What are you To walk on all fours. That is the law. To slurp. Up our drink. That is the law. We are not men. <laughs> to eat flesh and fish anytime. <laughs> So Moreau is uh, tragically killed at this point in the movie, Josh, and they have like a little bit of a funeral. And I think the remaining people here on the island, uh, least, they Vader him, they Vader him. Yes. <laughs> the remaining people try to figure out like what to do. But fucking Edward Douglas is uh, trying to get laid at this funeral, isn't he? Oh, dude, he's <sighs> either he's trying to get himself laid slash killed. I was going to say, I guess he went beast mode. I already made that joke, though. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he tries to to bang... I forget her name. I keep want, I just so. want to call her The Craft. <laughs> <laughs> but he goes to bang her until he realizes she's got some, like, some beast teeth, some vampire-ish teeth, and some, like, elf ear thing going on. And he's not so much into it. There is a moment. Hold on. I've got it written down. He's like, if not for you, I would have said your father had failed or something to that extent. It's oh, like, because yeah. I, I want to fuck you. I mean, you, you're not like the other ones. <laughs> you're hot. <laughs> yeah, I find you sexually attractive. So I'm going to call you your dad's singular success. Uh -huh. If they were all sexually attractive, I never would have objected to this genetic experimentation. Maybe it's just like he's a last ditch effort. Like he knows everyone's gonna die soon. He's like, I just want to get laid one time. <laughs> like, no, I just want to die while the world, or fuck while the world's burning around. I've been on this island for so long. I will bang a manimal. <laughs> manimal. At this point, he's been on the island for maybe a week. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a long time for him. It is apparently it is. Yeah. This dude's a chronic masturbation problem, you know. <laughs> like, Steve Montgomery doesn't handle this death well, does he? No, Montgomery. Mo Montgomery's really the one who apparently wants to die. He just goes total raver style, breaks down. Ha just, it, it, I mean, this is where we really get the Lord of the Flies meltdown, where they all just give in to their most animalistic desires and do whatever they want. And uh, I guess it's another not so thinly veiled allegory there that like. The animals that were supposed to be human give in to their animal side. Montgomery, who's supposed to be human, goes with them. Well, Steve, where do, where does the line end between animal and man and stuff? Whoa. Oh, if only that in question had been asked more intelligently. <laughs> By the movie, I mean. Like, yeah, I just just totally miss it. There's so many good films where that's addressed in some way. Like, what's the line between a man and a human? What's the line between a human and a machine? Blah, blah, blah. And, and it's supposed to be... Well, actually, it's not even really supposed to be the underlying. Like, H.G. Wells' underlying theme in this is, was really more about God's... I mean, not God. Man's inclination to want to play God more than anything else. And this version of it really is more about 
it's really a Lord of the Flies ripoff with animal people. <laughs> they even I would say the fucking human centipede answers that question better. Yeah, exactly. You know, they even turn Aissa into into poor piggy. She becomes the fucking sacrifice. I really like though Montgomery's like impression of Brando. It's great. I'm I like... was about to say that's the best part. I was in stitches. Do the Castillo pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and then give not that which is holy unto the dog. What does she need? Animal or man? What am I looking for? Angry. The Castillo and the Scar. See, and this is another weird one. Is like they're, the two of them were depicted as having this huge feud, but Kilmer has said in the past that he would only do the impression if Brando gave him permission to. Like, out of respect, he wouldn't impersonate Brando without permission. It's like, did you two hate each other or not? <laughs> like, I, I like that he starts to lose his mind. And, and from my perspective, he just like goes down like a rabbit hole of drugs because he seems yeah. pretty fucked up the rest of the movie. It's almost like... I see him channeling a little bit of Mad Mardigan in that. It's like Mad Mardigan on hallucinogenics. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Azazello, who was like the house dog man, changes sides though. Like after Moreau dies, he immediately joins Hyena's crew. This dude was a piece of shit the whole time. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That, that dude clearly was never into it. You don't snap that quickly if you were ever on board with it being the other way. There's no resistance at all. I was expecting there to be a, something more to his character that explained this erratic behavior, but I guess he's just like, what, a, just a psycho for no reason? <laughs> yeah, he is just yeah. a psycho. <laughs> I mean, again, going back to my point, like I, I wouldn't want this movie crafted by this group of people to be any longer than it was, but if it had been crafted properly and competently, I, again, at, at two, two and a quarter, two and a half hours, they would have had enough time to give some kind of motivation to that character. And instead, it's just like, eh, shit's going to hell. I guess I'll help burn everything down. I'm as a Zillo, sir, and I'm a psycho. Yeah, right? he starts off being so well-mannered. I told Corey, I, I, I like to imagine it was in that very moment George Lucas was like, that right there, that's going to that's gonna be my Django. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, slash Boba. That guy's gotten to play both sides that fast. Uh, yeah. That dude's in, like, everything Star Wars now. Like, right? Yeah. And they, they uh, he got to do the redub for the special. I can't, God damn it, now I'm angry. I can't remember the original actor's name. But when they redubbed Boba's voice... It, there's that moment in, I think it's an Empire, where Boba talks to, there's a few actually, where Boba talks to uh, Vader or to somebody. I need him alive. Yeah, right. And they, they ended up redubbing the original line from Morrison's voice so it would line up. Yeah. yeah. The original was better. All right. It was. He's no good to me dead. He's no good to me dead. I get that choice, but Boba's original voice is so fucking awesome. It is. It was way better. It's and way I like, better. I get it. I get it for the sake of that continuity he was trying to do, but Lucas has gotten way too caught up, and I'm going to do it because I can. Right. Anyway, yeah. As Azello, he rips out his implant, or rather, Hyena rips out his implant, which Steve is missing from the Amazon version. That's another moment of violence. He approaches Hyena, and he yeah. says, I know where guns are. I can give you guys guns. Let me join you. Just take out the implant. So Hyena approaches him, and this is the part where it's cut out of Amazon Prime's version. He reaches in his ribcage and rips it out in kind of like a sadistic pleasure. You saw that, right, Josh? Yes, yes. It's funny, so the torrent you, you watched must have been, or I'm sorry, the legal rental you watched must have been... The legally acquired copy of the film, yes. Right? Must have been a rip from like a director's cut home video. Funny, I've, I've got a copy of it on... A Japanese copy of it on Laserdisc that I think would have the original cut, but I just watched it on Amazon out of convenience. And I'm thinking about it. Thinking about it, I realized that you're absolutely right, but I didn't notice while I was watching. It's funny. It's around this point in the story where Douglas, who had previously been trying to figure out why the fuck is he on this island, I guess kind of gets his answer, although it's pretty vague. It's an answer that makes no fucking sense. It makes no sense. Like, I, do you want me to say it? Yeah. Or, he and he discovers he's known the whole time that he must be there for a reason. It, Moreau has been trying to create a cocktail or a method so that the animal people won't need the serum anymore. 
He's been trying to create a way to just stop them from regressing entirely. And Douglas discovers that after they got him off the boat, they stole DNA from him because his DNA is supposed to be the basis for this fix. And it's like, all right, but how did they know who the fuck you were beforehand? How did they know which boat you were going to be on? How did they make your boat sink? Why did they leave you floating in the ocean with two other people for days before they retrieved you? How did they know exactly where you'd be? They when caused they found this you? plane crash. Yeah, did they cause the plane crash? Like, and how is it possible? I mean, I, maybe the idea is he really did get picked up by accident, and then they decided to just blood test him while he was there. But even that is really fucking thin, and they're never specific about it. So it's like I, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. I, it would, if you're going to write the story that way, they should have redone the beginning to make it so that they knew about him somehow. Like, they lured him there, you know? Give them a reason to want this guy, and then have them kind of trick him into being there. I don't know. Meanwhile, Montgomery is down there in the church area, kind of, like, losing his shit. He basically, like, encourages, I think, the animals to take drugs and have an orgy. So there is some sex in there, right? Why would you build a Christian church on an island where you're God? Hmm... No, I guess there. it's not really a Christian church, is it? I guess it's true. Yeah. Yeah. The laws are handed down from their god, from Moreau. Okay, you're right. Fair point. So Val shows up with his best Brando cosplay and starts handing out drugs like it's the set of the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> and at this point, they just have a big old fucking orgy. And Tamora Morrison shows up and just caps the fuck out of Val. Well, things didn't work out. Moreau wanted to turn animals into humans and humans into gods. But it's instinct and reason, instinct and reason. What's instinct to a dog? To hunt, to kill, master. <laughs> to run back. I want to go to dog heaven. <laughs> yes, he ends his life. I want to go to doggy heaven. He asks for it. Literally, is it just kill me? Why? You don't want to party it out with the animal people? I guess not. Yeah, I guess not. He's just done done with it. It seemed like some of the animal hybrid ladies really liked Val, you know? Yeah, yeah. He could have spent his time having some human-animal hybrid babies. Oh, fucking so gross. Yeah, I wouldn't want any of that. <laughs> Once Ice is gone, I'd be like, you know what? Kill me, too. <laughs> there are no more babes on this island. <laughs> Steve, Hyena's crew, they kind of like show up. They're destroying everything. They're causing chaos. They're burning down the compound. And they catch up with Aisa. Yeah, yeah. So they corner her and and Douglas in a in the building there. And she makes it's the only moment where she goes cat. All of a sudden she starts making cat noises and somehow she's they have her like climb a wall, basically, like she's getting away like a cat. Which sort of makes sense if you're a cat, but she's not a cat. She has hands and feet. She doesn't have paws. She can't climb the way a cat does. She's got cat genes, though. Yeah, okay, well, I guess that's the same as Peter Parker being able to stick to a <laughs> wall with human fingers because he got bitten by a radioactive spider. Yeah. Like, fucking... But they, they grab... Black cat, bro. Right? She ends up becoming Piggy, and they just grab her and straight up hang her. It's even worse than hanging her. They just put the noose around her neck and toss her over the edge. It just breaks her neck on the way over. Yeah. And, like, I don't get it. What'd she do to you? Azazello is mad because the father used to beat him. Oh, yeah. And never beat her. Right, he never touched your soft skin. You know, and he seems to kind of want to have sex with her. He does. It's almost like like he hangs her because he knows she won't do it. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Now, it, it, Douglas is not very... He's kind of concerned about it for a minute. And then he's basically like, well, I guess I'm not getting any from her either. So he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he used to beat him like a bantha. 
Me compensa. Uh, but can I climb inside of him to keep me warm? If, oh, that was the bantha. All right, never like mind. Like a bantha. Like a bantha. <laughs> like a bantha. Wouldn't it be funny if, like, hyena's about to kill Azazello, and then Fennec shows up and snipes hyena? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, look, as a Star Wars crossover, it wouldn't have been any worse than the holiday special. <laughs> so, oh. That's the bar. Oh, it's yeah. true. You know, I, hell, if this had been a Lucas presentation, it probably would have been the same movie, just more CG. Like. So, Josh, Hyena is really doing some crazy shit here. He's setting buildings on fire. They got machine guns at this point. They're fucking shooting people. It's like fucking RoboCop. He takes Douglas, and he insists that Douglas tell everyone that's left alive that Hyena is the new god. Five man. Please tell them that I am God. <laughs> So this is like the crux of the film, the, the the message, or at least part of the message. It it doesn't matter. <laughs> For some reason, the hyena man needs validation that he's Captain Big Dick of the island or the fly shit. I, I don't know. Yeah. At this point, it doesn't matter. Just get the scenes done. He He kind of tricks him into killing his own men by like, Suggesting because they all ate Marlon Brando, they all received God slash Godfather powers. But there can only be one numero uno God, right? You're right. Okay. You are a God. No! Again. You are... A god of all gods. To them, to obey me like they did the father. You all killed the father. Who is the new father? Who is God number one? Who should they obey? Him? Him. You see, there must be a god number one. He outsmarts him, doesn't he? He uses his human intelligence to outsmart these dumb fucking animal mutant hybrids. <laughs> Hyena human hybrid. He uses his man brain. There has to be a god number one. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna take down like a cult church. Like, I'm going to go to, like, the leader and, like, point to his lieutenants. I'm going to be like, which one is God number one? There can only be one. Yes. Is it him? Or him? There must be a God number uh, one. It's Christopher Lambert. He's the one. <laughs> That's true. At this point, he, like, turns on his own men. He shoots a bunch of fellow manimals. And then, like, a random red shirt manimal shoots him. <laughs> And then he decides to go into a burning building. Well, Maling is the true hero of the situation. Because Maling throws the torch into the gasoline, which causes the explosion, which creates the distraction. Right, the real hero. So don't, don't, uh, you know, forget about my guy Maling. I love that dude. <laughs> my boy Maling needs the, the little chimpanzee guy that bops him on the head afterwards. <laughs> he, yeah. like, bops him on the head, like, <laughs> once or twice, and... <laughs> he beats him. No, that's uh, that's Assassimon. Assassimon. 
<laughs> Ugly gorilla. Bad. No. No, that's Amy. Green drop drink. Josh, did you appreciate the scene, though, when Hyena walks into the flaming building, <laughs> sets himself on fire, and says, Why? Father, why? I was laughing too hard at that point. <laughs> <laughs> So, you, what, you didn't take in the emotional weight? Emotional weight? Co- comedy's an emotion, right? Like, a comedic emotion? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Comedy. Comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 like, literally cuts to, like, the next morning. This movie, like, can't wait to end. And it, it just cuts to Edward Douglas, Edward Furlong, who can't fucking wait to leave this goddamn <laughs> island? And who, what's the gorilla? Assassin? Assassin? Ass man. <laughs> the ass blaster. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, you gotta stay and hang out with us. And Douglas is like, oh dude, I'm, I'm so good on that. Like I'm, I'm straight G. I got a little thing going on at three. I can't really. Uh... Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get on. <laughs> He's like, I'll come back, though. Uh, yeah, I'll see you guys real soon. <laughs> and then just cut to, like, ADR of him just, this happened to me. The end. Yeah. You're probably wondering how I got in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> the movie should have opened with him in front of the hyena man. <laughs> like, uh, I bet you're wondering how I got here. It all started with a plane crash. <laughs> Now, Sayer of the Law tells Douglas that, like, the remaining animal people, they have to accept what they are. Like, they don't want any doctors to show up. It's time to, like, live with their existence and accept it rather than trying to, um, you know, manipulate it through science into something that it's not. Yeah, unfortunately, that character would have been dead three minutes later. (laughs) They're eating his fucking face. There's no way the other ones, like Hyena, are letting that one... Sayer of the law, there's no more law, motherfucker. You're lunch. You're the sayer of I'm dinner. Oh, and Edward Blake has that monologue about society and things and stuff. And who is the real animal? That's the question. Who's the real animal, Steve? Who is the real animal? Um, I don't know. Is it the monkeys? <laughs> <laughs> it's the monkeys from Jumanji. Oh, yes. This is a true record of what I saw. I set it down, leaving out only the latitude and longitude of the island as a warning to all who would follow in Moreau's footsteps. Most times I keep the memory far in the back of my mind, a distant cloud. But there are times when the little cloud spreads until it obscures the sky. At those times, I look about me at my fellow men and I'm reminded of some likeness to the beast people. And I feel as though the animal is surging up in them. And they're neither holy animal nor holy man, but an unstable combination of both as unstable as anything Moreau created. And I go in fear. We live in a society. Yeah, so, I mean, it closes with that dialogue, like, where Douglas says, like, he went back to the world and he almost never thinks about it again. And when he does, it's he's frightened and like he sees their behavior and humanity. And I don't know, like I know it's super like on the nose, but I saw this movie as a kid, right? That was really fucking deep to me when I was a kid. Dude. Yeah, I mean, I saw this movie for the first time as a thirteen-year-old in a theater. So back then, I was like, "Whoa!" Oh, and then oh, I, re- I never thought of it that way, right? But then you get older and you realize that there's like a hundred and six movies that make the same point better. So yeah. <laughs> there are episodes of Star Trek The Next Gen that make this point better. <laughs> right? I think there's an Alex Mack Saves the World from Nickelodeon yeah. in about 1995 that makes this point better. <laughs> a Power Rangers two-parter. <laughs> right? <laughs> the Meg is the word learned. 
Are we the real Megazord? <laughs> <laughs> right? I hope so. No, but you carry the real Megazord with you in your heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> After enough soul searching. <laughs> so that's the movie. Josh, do you have any final thoughts before ratings? So I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I, I knew nothing about this movie, which is weird can i because i consider myself a bad movie connoisseur and i was forbidden from looking anything up so uh i knew very little about this movie uh and after watching the movie and after hearing about the production problems everything just seems like it was a fucking circus it sounds about right yeah <laughs> steve any final thoughts before ratings yeah i mean this movie is a lot of almost everybody's fault. I mean, there's a few people that got out that that really were just kind of victims of it. But, like, it's Brando and Kilmer's fault for being so ridiculous and difficult. It's Richard Stanley's fault for not making more of an effort early on when there was a chance for him to save his position as the film's director. It's the fault of the people who were there early with him for not defending him more. It's the fault of the people in charge at New Line for not realizing that they were giving Stanley more than he ever could have possibly handled being put in charge of. It's even, to an extent, I'll admit, a little bit Frankenheimer's fault because he was kind of a gruff guy who just wanted to get a stupid, mismanaged product finished as quickly as he could so that he could move on to directing the other three projects he'd gotten the studio to promise him. There's a lot of people at fault here, and you get what you get. Well, let's go into ratings then. Yeah. And I think, Josh, you should go first. I mean, this is your first time watching it. You hadn't heard anything about the production. What rating are you going to give Island of Dr. Moreau on any rating scale you want? So I'm going to give this movie... Two drugged out Val Kilmers out of ten. <laughs> this movie's embarrassing. Uh, it's like from a fundamental basis, the, the story just seems too silly to take serious at all. And it's like if I was a producer, I would have shut this shit down. They didn't, and in the end, everyone lost. Yeah. Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more about that that sentiment. They, they probably should have gotten to a point where they just... I mean, I guess going back to what we were saying before, it may have been one of those situations where New Line really couldn't afford to, but in, the, in any other situation, I would have just shut it down and written it off. Well, I'm going to go next, and I'm going to say that I'm the one that benefited from the production of this movie. <laughs> if they could reach at least one person, you know, your mission is a success, and they reached me early on, and for that reason, I'm going to give this movie a surprising 8 out of 10. What? what? That's disgusting. I'm going to go vomit. 8 out of 10 Maling reading Yates is. <laughs> I, oh, God. This I've, is a very flexible rating system. I fucking love this movie, dude. I do. I love it. I've loved this movie ever since I was a kid. And it's probably one of those situations where I've seen it too many times to be objective on it. <laughs> I have movies like that too, in fairness. <laughs> so, like, I'll get into it a little bit. Sure, the themes are, like, heavy-handed, but what I like about this movie is, like, the concept of this fucking mad scientist dude living on an island, making these monstrosities that are, like, disgusting, and it's, like, borderline evil what he's doing, right? Like, I would say, like, this is, like, some sick, twisted shit that he's doing, but he's like been involved with it so long that he's accepted it. And then this outsider comes in and witnesses it all, and he witnesses it all at the time that it starts to crumble. And it's just chaotic, and these Animal Men special effects are truly amazing. They're some of the best of this type. They're s seriously fucking awesome. A few years later, like, give this shit five years, and this would have been fully CGI, and it would have been a fucking disaster. It's true. At least it looks good, if nothing else. And yeah. honestly, like, the performance choices are fucking out there. But to me, it works because of that. <laughs> like, Mar uh, Moreau, uh, Marlon Brando, like, he makes some choices for his character that, like, 
kind of makes sense that they kept in like the yeah. stuff with the heat and like his weird of course he's gonna wear robes he thinks he's like jesus christ you know like right. and like that wasn't in the script he just wanted to do it because it was convenient but somehow that kind of like fit david thewlis the whole time is like aghast and appalled and that's probably just because of the way the production was being handled and it carried over yeah. to his character. <laughs> yeah, and one of their big complaints the whole time was that they didn't think they were getting the performance feedback they wanted from Frankenheimer, but I almost feel like he did that to get that because I think that was one of the few parts that worked for it. I don't know. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, so, I mean, and plus this movie's super nostalgic for me. Heavy-handed, certainly, <laughs> but but I do like this movie. To me, it's like kind of a, like a, an interesting romp some characters have stuck with me. That little guy, Magi, he's hilarious when he says, look at him, Maling. There's something like so charming about the character of Maling. I know I've talked about that guy a lot. Uh, Tamara Morrison's a fucking legend. And like, it's so funny to me that he's the dog guy, but he doesn't really look like a dog. He just looks like a fucked up face with dreads. Yeah, thank you. They kept calling him dog person. I'm like, that's not a dog. I don't know what that is, but it's not a dog. How many dogs have dreads? Yeah, exactly. I've never met a Jamaican dog with <laughs> yeah. dreads before. I like. But I, I, I fucking, I, I watch it every time. I love seeing him stand up and say, my name is Ezezelosa. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I've. I like this movie. I know it's a fucking disaster, but I like it. I like to imagine you as a kid watching this all like, this isn't the Warriors of Virtue. <laughs> Warriors of Virtue sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, on any rating scale you want, what are you going to give the island to Dr. Moreau? I guess I'm going to split the difference. I, I'm actually going to be generous enough to give this film five manimals out of ten. Mm -hmm. And... I agree with oh, most of what Josh was saying. It's a disaster, and there's a lot of it that's just not good. But the problem is I also kind of agree with Corey. The, the makeuping is really impressive. As per normal, Stan Winston's shop shows up and gets the job done. Yep. That shit looks great. They, um, did, they did better than they like needed to. They could have done yeah, a shitty job. You thank know? you. That's part of what I'm thinking. I agree with you. The, the makeup effects was really almost better than everything else in the movie, and that deserves, given the amount of work that takes, it deserves a point and, and you know plus they only had 14 people they were just rough for a crew that size and the whole thing was so messed up yeah so those look good some of the 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 sets i think are really nice looking i really like the inside of miro's house there's a couple of scenes i really like the feel of like there's one moment where moreau's on the hammock in the rain and even if the scene itself is a little ridiculous something about that moment i really like the feel of so a few very brief brief moments like that where it lines up correctly it's just that so much of the rest of it is such a fucking disaster. There's no real arc. Moreau comes and goes too quickly. A lot of the, the story doesn't either doesn't make sense or it's just stupid. The production being a disaster definitely bled its way into the film. But I will also concede, I saw this movie at 13 in a the theater and a lot of that didn't bother me at the time. And as a kid growing up, I never went out of my way to rent this, but if it came on HBO and I was channel flipping, I actually did usually stop to rewatch at least part of it. So, yeah, I'll go for five, because I think there's a lot of stuff that's at least this bad out there, so it deserves, I guess, to be called average. But, man, what a shit show. <laughs> a couple of things that I should have said in final thoughts. One is that John Frankenheimer hated Val Kilmer so much that, and this is kind of famous now, he said that if he was making a movie about Val Kilmer's life, he still wouldn't cast Val Kilmer, right? which is just classic. <gasps> and apparently when he had shot Val Kilmer's final scene, like when they had done everything oh, yeah. they needed him, he said, get this guy the hell off my, my set. set. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, the little guy, uh, his name's Nelson De La Rosa. Nelson De La Rosa. He's the, you know, the mini me to Marlon Brando. He punched the guy that plays Maling in the balls. Yeah. Just because he was kind of like being Brando-ish and being like... He was kind of being mentored in a way by Brando. Yeah. Even though they didn't speak the same language. And some of the production guys said that De La Rosa was kind of like that anyway. That he, he was really famous in Latin America and knew that his size made it difficult for other people to want to do anything to him. So he would just do whatever he wanted. Here's the thing though, dude. If that little guy punched me in the balls... He would get fucking tossed. Yeah, I might punt him. I like that dude would get launched. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm punting the fuck out of him. 
like at some point I would never pick a fight. I don't want to pick a fight with anybody, really, but especially somebody that much that little. But yeah, once you punch me in the nuts, you kind of got whatever's coming, coming. If you're a grown man and you hit me, you are getting hit back. Right? That's the thing. You're an adult. You knew what was going to happen. So, like, I mean, fuck, frankly, I was that... I was that way with my brother when I was when I was twelve and he was eight. Like he's old enough to know what's gonna happen if he hits me. <laughs> so like There's only a few people in this world that I, I think I could beat up, and that little guy is definitely one of them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what if he's like a badass? He's like Yoda. <laughs> yeah, like if he's Flipping Yoda. around like Yoda and attacking the clones. <laughs> Dude. I'm sorry. I love Yoda. I love Star. But that moment with him and, and Dooku is so ridiculous. It's so the, fucking, the fucking flying around. All right, thank you. Ah, God, no. Yoda doesn't need to fight that way. Yoda's a force. Yoda, Yoda will just collapse the building on top of you. He doesn't even need to do that shit. Well, they they did address that in the movie, but not well. Yeah. Like, I was gonna say they throw rocks at each other. The thing about Yoda is like I always looked at him as like he doesn't like Yoda and Palpatine to me. Like, watching the original trilogy, I was like, these guys are so powerful, they don't even need to use a fucking lightsaber. Yeah. Like, like they'll just fuck you up in some other ways that, like, you, you'll you have never seen that power before, and they'll just whip yeah. it out. Yeah. I imagine Yoda, and I mean this as a compliment, like, the moment Nakira or Kaneda opens up a gravity Kaneda! well, right? <laughs> and it he just opens up a gravity well, and anything inside the ball suddenly just, it's done. Like, I imagine Yoda on that level. Yeah. Like, he just, in his prime, yeah. Right, yeah. Anyway, we're about to wrap up, but before we do, Josh, thank you very much for being a special guest on this episode. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a long pod. Where can people find you, and what is it that you do? You can find me at Review D O D or Review Inc., where I, I make fun of movies. I haven't posted in a while, but I'm working on that. Uh, would you like to promote any RoboCop-related content? Oh, yeah. By the time this goes up, there will be a RoboCop 2 highlight video. Uh, we're trying to get more highlight videos on this channel. So the only way to ensure that is to go and watch it, share it, like it, favorite it, bop it, pull it, uh, all that shit. Also, just let us know if you would like any other pods to be turned into highlight videos. Watch Josh's channel. He's funny. He is funny. And I, I, I thank you again very much, Josh, for being here. And thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it when you come out. I know you're a busy man. Thank you. If you, the listener, it. want to write in, you can email us at bigdumbmovie at gmail.com. And you can message me on Instagram, Big Dumb Movie Podcast. Follow us there. I post a lot of memes and cool stuff. The biggest ask I have of you, the listener, is to leave us a positive rating and written review on Apple Podcasts. That is a great way to support us. I don't ask for your money, but if you do that, it would be fucking awesome. Also, if you subscribe to us on YouTube and give our videos a thumbs up, as you see, we release a new one. Even if you don't use YouTube to listen to us, that would be very much appreciated. It's been a fun episode. We all thank you very much for listening and enduring this longer episode. We love you. Good night. Wait, I'm asking for your money. The Kickstarter's to buy me an 8K TV. Find me online.
This is gonna be insane. I don't know how we're gonna do this. One scene at a time. <laughs> so like the first Ninja Turtles movie, right? They have to fight Foot Clan, right? And these guys are like kind of trained, but they're really no match for the Ninja Turtles. No, it's like a ragtag bunch of kids, you know? It's it's kind of like... They got some karate training, but they're not like yeah that good. Right, yeah. They've it's, been it's, training for like six months probably. <laughs> right, I think Shredder at that point was just like, I need kids that'll do whatever we tell them, so... <laughs> Just and, grab what you can. But then Shredder is like super trained. Like he's he's a fucking badass and he kicks the shit out of all the Ninja Turtles, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's one element they, again, soften way up because there's some messed up stuff in some of the comics. I mean, there's if, during one part of the run. It makes think, the turtle suck his dick. Right. In, in one run, I think this is one of the things Laird didn't love so much, but I thought was very cool at the time. In one run, I think when, when I either early idw or when image was publishing it uh raf loses a hand in a fight with shredder i think it's raf yeah there's another up there's another issue where shredder gets a hold of him and literally just tries to separate him from his shell as a means to kill him and yeah it's yeah. like it gets really messed up but at least in the at least in the first film there's that that bit of he's an actual threat and can kind of beat the hell out of them right they get like know. beat bad yeah right? they need splinter to come save them so like right. that's that's the underlying threat in the first movie yeah and as a side note i really like that like the mini boss casey jones fights the mini boss <laughs> yeah like i think that's just like good writing to have <laughs> not the turtles fight him right but, like the other guy fight him It'll and like casey jones wins because he's just like a street fighter <laughs> like that other guy doesn't expect casey jones to like <gasps> grab a fucking golf club and like just whack at him, yeah. hockey stick, whatever you can get a hold of, right? You know, and like, yeah, Casey's Casey's crazy, which I love, and uh, uh, Elias Katias Kateras Kotias, yeah. I, every time I see him, he's been in a million other things. He was he's on or was on one of the Law and Order shows, and like it doesn't matter. Every time I see him, it's like oh, it's Casey Jones, right? You know? It's like the pointing Leonardo DiCaprio meme. It's like <laughs> Casey Jones, right? <laughs> So, uh. second movie, though, things escalate, and this is what I was talking about earlier. They have to fight new enemies, right? Shredder realizes that he needs a way to beat them at their own games. Bebop and Rocksteady. So, he creates the ripoff Bebop and Rocksteady. We did a podcast on yeah. Secret of the Use, right? Taka and Razor. That's right. Yeah. So, he creates them. So, now, like, they can't beat them physically. So, like, that's the escalation of things. And plus, in the comics and in the cartoon they fight a lot of non-human entities, you know? Right. So, like, that's it's kind of like a continuation of that tradition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it is. And get, get the other animals into the game. I mean, ultimately, that's what it's about. And, like, I mean, that was kind of the fun part with it. It's sort of like, like Guar. I hate it when people try to take Guar too seriously. It started as a joke. The guys that created it openly state that it started as a joke. And when it became popular, they just decided to keep doing it. Like... It was always meant to be tongue in cheek. It was never meant to be looked at as like real dark metal. Right, like, Slipknot. I'm pretty sure was the same concept. Right, because I've heard like the singer Corey Taylor say some like weird things regarding Slip like when he was doing Stone Sour. Right, like when he started that band and he was like being interviewed. They were like, is it going to be like Slipknot? And he said, no, it's going to be real music. <laughs> like, he was basically, like, disregarding his own music as trash. Like, just metal trash. Like Right. But then, of course, people like it. Yeah, absolutely. You Same know? thing with Guar. Right. I mean, but Guar, like, at least their lyrics are, like, not taking themselves seriously. Yeah. It's a little bit of Poe's Law with Slipknot. But with Guar, like, they have songs like Fucking an Animal. Right. Grab it by the horns. Fucking an animal. <laughs> and they were, I, I mean, at least better at it than, um, oh, shit. What was the name of that group? They're still sort of around. Uh I can't even remember the name of that song now, but I can hear it in my head. It was popular in the late 90s. <sighs> do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. What was the name? The of Bloodhound Gang. The Bloodhound Gang. Thank you. They were definitely yeah. not metal. <laughs> no, 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 no. But they were like a spoof act that was – in. but I think that dude was like, I actually want to, want to offend people. And it's like your songs are just stupid. Right. Um, they're, they're like immature, right? Yeah. So like yeah. when you're a little kid, you think it's cool? That's but it's thing. no wonder adults didn't like it because – not because it's like, oh my god, how can kids listen to this? No, it's not that. It's that it's cringe. 
That's the biggest problem with teenagers is there's so much of that music that they're like, my parents don't want me to listen to it because they don't want me to rebel. And it's actually just because it's like it's shit. What you're listening to is shit. Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's not just like, I don't want to sound like a boomer. Like, oh, your music sucks. It's not just that. It's that like it's. Right. It's. It's stupid. Yeah, it's not like, even listen that, to these lyrics. Like it's it's a joke. When you're yeah. when you're older, you'll be embarrassed. <laughs> that's yes, that's it's, it's yeah right. That's exactly it. It's not even <laughs> like I'm too old for this sound. It's just it really is objectively. You're gonna be embarrassed later that you listen to this in the first place. Just like I kind of am with like li- when I listen back to edema. <laughs> you know, it's like embarrassing a little bit. It's like oh god. Oh, absolutely. Or like Limp Biscuit, you know? And I well, thought that was so cool. That's a perfect example. I thought Limp Biscuit was so cool. A lot of kids did. A lot. Of, yeah, I mean, that was, they were the height of that performance metal, whatever you want to call it. I, there was this one girl in my class, junior year of high school, that was so Fred Durst obsessed. She wore the, the khaki pants with the white shirt and the red baseball cap pretty much every day at school. Man. Yeah, dude, there was a girl at my school that wore the red hat too, just like him. It was always like, it that was a girl, like she was like obsessed with Limp Bizkit. It was always that one particular type of girl that was a little bit tomboy, but not quite, you know, and like usually skinny. Like, yeah. It is a tomboy kind of look. Yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, the kind of chick that like, we're just sound testing right now, right? <laughs> well, this goes at the end of the episode. Okay, well then, then I'm not going to keep talking. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I will get us back on track then, right? So, Escalation and Ninja Turtles movies. We were talking about how bad 3 is. So, the first one, the second one, the second one escalates their threats. The third one, they have no threat because they travel in time. People incorrectly call it Turtles in Time. They travel back to feudal Japan. Their biggest threat is, uh, I forget his name. He has like some generic name, but he's a white dude on a horse. Yeah. He's like a real like Tom Cruise like... Last Samurai well, dude, villain. That's the joke, right? They travel back in time to Samurai era Japan, and the bad guy is still ultimately a white dude. I I don't. What the fuck? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? The bad guy when they were in present day New York was at least Japanese. Like Shredder's at least Japanese. They switched. They flipped it on his head. They flipped it. What the fuck? That is crazy to think about. <laughs> Wow, man. Uh, what the fuck kind of shit is that? Yeah, right? Like, they couldn't even make... They could have made him some evil evil daimyo or something. You know, real bad feudal lord. There is a lord of some yeah. kind, but I think... He's real secondary. I think he um, even, like, realizes the error of his ways at the end or something. They right. kill the white guy. Well, they don't kill him, you know, because it's a kid's movie. But, like, yeah. they indirectly are the result of him falling off a cliff. Remember, he falls off a That's cliff. Right. And very famously, there's no splash. Yes. He just disappears into green screen. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess, <clears throat> you know, you go the other way, you open yourself up to the complaints that, like, the Asian guy only ever gets cast as either the bad guy or the sidekick, which is, in fairness, kind of true a lot of the time. But, uh, yeah, and it's true. He does, the Asian character redeems himself and the white guy does. But it's so weird that the white dude's like the primo character there. Did you see everything everywhere all at once? I haven't actually watched it yet. I'm embarrassed to say. I really want to see it. Dude, watch it. It's so good. Yeah. But like, lately, like some like Asian stereotypes have been being shattered for me. And I'm really like happy. Yeah. And I was talking about this, I think, on the Everything Everywhere pod we did with spoilers. Right. But like. When I think of, like, an Asian man in a movie, in an American movie, I think of, like, him being, like, stoic, you know, and, yeah. like, cold. Yeah. And, and, like, it's because there's, like, a stereotype that's been, like, implanted. Right. That, like, the Asian guy has to be, like, the, the cool, silent, like, Bruce Lee type, you Yeah, know? when they finally stop just giving Asian characters outright racist roles, like Mickey Rooney's part in Breakfast at Tiffany's. They, oh, well, that's a white dude. Right, exactly. <laughs> just a white dude playing the most racist version of an Asian possible. <laughs> But then they slowly transition to it's like, fine, we'll start giving Asians more serious parts, but it'll only be as a character who's there to impart some kind of Eastern knowledge, <laughs> you know? Like, even even Mr. Miyagi, who I love and is definitely one of the more 
respectful portrayals. Even there, he's mostly just like, I'm going to teach you the Japanese mm-hmm. ways, white boy. Miyagi. Miyagi. And it's funny because he's like not like that. Like Pat Morita doesn't sound like that. No. He doesn't act like that. They, and yeah, Morita's... But they're like, he's like, turn on the Asian. I mean, he did develop his method, though, for that movie. Right. Like he decided that <laughs> he's going to play it that Which way. Which is the only reason I really respect it and yeah. have no real... Compl- I mean, at least as someone who's, who's white doesn't really get a vote in that regard. But still, like it doesn't... I wouldn't find it bothersome because that was his his choice it wasn't something they pushed on him right so yeah i heard him talk about his method in an interview i thought it was pretty funny yeah and he actually commented about how he would get cast to play all sorts of asians basically because white people don't know the difference like if they needed a korean guy if they needed a chinese guy it's just like oh pat looks asian so we'll cast him in the bar right. <laughs> you know, there's like, a good but... joke about that in falling down Okay. Remember, like, the Vietnamese store owner? Like, he gets his store smashed up That's with Michael right. Douglas. And he goes to the police station. And then, like, he's, like, speaking Vietnamese. And he's all mad. And he's, like, kind of a little bit causing a scene. And the detective is, like, Robert, um, what's his name? Oh, Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall yeah. is, like, he looks at it like his partner, who's, like, also Asian. He's, like, what is this guy saying? <laughs> and he's, like, if you haven't noticed, I'm Japanese. Right. He's Vietnamese. <laughs> right. I don't speak that language. <laughs> like, <laughs> like even if I had a boss at work for a while. He's still there. He's just not my boss anymore. I love this dude. He, he's got our Vietnamese name, but he goes by Tom for Americans. And uh, he he was a refugee from the war as a kid. He has a really fucked up story. It's nuts. But uh, we had, when I was working for him, one of the younger guys who was working for us at the shop, he was mainly the, mostly the truck driver for our repair shop. And he was a nice guy. He didn't mean to be offensive, but kind of an idiot. And we were over at Amgen picking up a piece of equipment and there were two other people nearby, two Chinese people who were having a conversation with each other in Mandarin. And Josh looks at Tom and he's like, can you understand what they're saying? And Tom's like, I'm Vietnamese. Like, <laughs> like no, I don't speak Mandarin. <laughs> like, fuck. But you're of the Orient. Right, exactly. <laughs> you got to know it, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you, the country you live in is adjacent to theirs, <laughs> you know? And it's like you love it, but if you ask people in in northeastern in the northeastern U.S. near the French speaking part of Canada if they speak French, they'll be like, "Why the fuck would I speak French?" Right. 